Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, Honorable Shiyuk, faculty and respected students. We are approaching the last half of Ramadan, so now is the perfect time to get ready for the final countdown and how to maximize our ibadah in this beautiful month and what remains of Ramadan. And I'm sure everybody's so excited today to hear from Sheikh Abdurrahim McCarthy on how to maximize our ibadah in these last 10 days. I'm, I'm ready to get motivated to enter this period of Ramadan with, with intensity and seeking the pleasure of Allah, and I'm sure all of you are as well. Just to let you know a little bit more about Sheikh Abdurrahim McCarthy, he's of Irish-American heritage and was born and raised in the United States. After accepting Islam in 1994, he moved to Sudan and then Saudi Arabia, where he spent 10 years in Medina, studying, studying under the scholars and as a student in the University of Medina. He graduated from the Arabic Institute and then from the faculty of Dawa and Usul ad din from the Islamic University of Medina. He is also very well known from his television shows on Peace TV, Huda TV, Taiba TV, Sharda TV, and Qatar TV, along with lecturing internationally with the Peace TV conference and conferences in the UK, Canada, Ireland, Qatar, UAE, and Sudan. Sheikh McCarthy has now decided to follow his roots and is living in Ireland while supporting Dawa projects internationally. He is an avid basketball and American football fan. He loves to read and spend time with his family. He also loves to be outdoors. And without any further ado, we welcome uh, our beloved Sheikh Abdurrahim McCarthy to get us motivated for the last half of this Ramadan and most especially the last 10 days. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Alhamdulillah, in today's webinar we're going to be looking into how to motivate ourselves and we're going to learn a little bit, a lot, a little bit about the do's and don'ts, inshallah, that we need to be focusing on during the last 10 days of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. <coughs> the key to being successful during the last 10 days of Ramadan is to follow in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, and focusing on how he used to utilize these last 10 days. And we look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during these last 10 days. Aisha, his wife, radiallahu anha, she described it, or described how he was during these last 10 days by saying, إِذَا دَخَلَ الْعَشَرْ شَدَّ مِئْزَرَهُ وَأَحْيَا لَيْلَهُ وَأَيْقَضَ أَهْلَهُ This hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari in Muslim where Aisha radiallahu anha said, if the 10 days, if he would enter into the 10 days, the last 10 days, that he would, and he'd tie up his, 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 his waistband. Meaning, what that means is to focus and to work harder uh, from you know, tying up the izah. And ahya laylahu, that he would stay awake for the night and that he would wake up his family as well. And another hadith, which comes in Sahih, al-Imam Muslim, that she said, كَانَ يَشْتَهِدُ فِي الْعَشْرِ الْعَوَاخِرِ مَا لَا يَشْتَهِدُ فِي غَيْرِهِ That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would strive that in the last ten days, that which he would not strive during other days. And as we know from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would focus on increasing in his ibadah and raising it to another level from the beginning of Ramadan. And that would come in several ways. From that, for example, is the hadith of Abdullah ibn, ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, that he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana ajwad al-nas wa ajwad ma yakun fi Ramadan hina ma yalqahu Jibreel fi yudarisuhu al-Quran. That the Prophet sallallahu was the most generous of people and he would be even more generous in Ramadan when Jibreel would come to him and teach him the Quran. So the Prophet sallallahu he would increase in his generosity he would increase in his ibadah uh, and his, in, his, in his recitation of the Qur'an. All of this, he would increase in it in Ramadan. However, the last 10 days, he would increase even more. So much so, as Aisha said in this hadith, and if we were to focus on these two hadith, we're going to take four key points that show the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what he used to do during these last 10 days. So the first thing is that he would increase in his worship. He would do more. He would strive harder during these last 10 days. 
so much so as it came in the first hadith that he would tie up the waistband and he meaning that he would work even harder and some of the scholars mention that this is also evidence that he would leave having relations with his wives as well during this time he wouldn't be with his wives during this time and that's because he would be in itikaf and just focusing on worship so he would be focusing even harder during these last 10 days and even leaving the relations with his wife so he can solely concentrate on the ibadah and that he would stay awake during the night and what does that mean that he would stay awake for the entire night or most of the night the scholars differed on this some of them said that means that he would stay awake for the entire night and some of them said that perhaps it was the majority of the night or he would stay awake longer than he would in general and as we know from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam outside of Ramadan that he wouldn't sleep most of the night anyway he would usually pray uh, half of the night or a little bit more or a little bit less so but in Ramadan these last 10 days he would stay awake all of the night or most of the night and also he would wake up his wife, his family in order for them to pray and this has been confirmed that the Prophet ﷺ, he used to wake up Aisha radiallahu anha and he would read to her the ayah the verse in Surah Taha وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالصَّبْرِ عَلَيْهَا and this is generally he would wake her up and read her this ayah saying order your family to pray and have patience upon it and this is the a reminder to all of us because sometimes we just want to focus on ourselves during these last 10 days and we forget to focus on our families but the true believer and the true person who is pious and has taqwa also focuses on bettering his family all the time if you look for example in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was describing Ismail and praising Ismail alayhi salam he said subhanahu wa ta'ala وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّ that remember in the book Ismail verily he was truthful true to his promise and he was a messenger and a prophet immediately after this in the next verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the actions that he used to do Ismail alayhi salam وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيَّةِ and he used to enjoy to his people the prayer and his family the prayer and the zakat and he was to his Lord pleasing alayhi salam so we must focus as well during these last 10 days as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did with our family waking up our wives encouraging them to pray encouraging them to read the Quran encouraging them to make dhikr when you see your family uh, on the phone or wasting time, they want to watch TV on the computer, we remind them of the importance of this time and we tell them to make dhikr, to remember Allah, to read something of the Quran. Even the young children, we should encourage them to do something, even if it's something small during these last 10 days, in order to encourage them and train them for the future as well, so they will be able to benefit from these uh, last 10 days, inshallah, when they become older, inshallah ta'ala. <coughs> also, a fifth thing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, if you were paying attention, we mentioned now from the hadith four things that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would focus on during the last ten days, and that was first of all increasing his worship, doing more that he used to do, and that he would, he said, tie up the izar, tie up the, the waistband, in order to what? Work even harder, and also to stay even away from his family during that time, because he would be in itikaf, and he would not even be having relations with his family during that time, and he would stay awake for the entire night or we said for uh, the most of the night and the fourth thing is that he would wake up his family and the fifth thing he would focus on is the i'tikaf that he would make i'tikaf alayhi salatu wassalam and he used to make i'tikaf sometimes he did it in the beginning of the month sometimes in the end of the month but towards the end of his life he started to always make it the last 10 days of Ramadan and he always made i'tikaf and he made it all of the time and focused on making it in the last 10 days because obviously this is the time of Laylatul Qadr and Atikaf is so important that one time he left the Atikaf one Ramadan because he saw that a bunch of small tents started to come up in the back of the masjids and realized that these tents belonged to his wives and what had happened is that some of the wives were staying in the tents and the other ones became jealous so all of them started to put their own little tent in the masjid and the Prophet said, him, you know, didn't want a fitna or any problem to happen between his family. So he delayed his etikaf and he made it up after Ramadan in Shawan. 
And that shows us, obviously, that the Kaf doesn't have to be in Ramadan. It can be any time during the year. But obviously, the best time is to be in Ramadan <coughs> and during the last 10 days of Ramadan. What are the virtues of the last 10 days of Ramadan? It's important that we know the virtues to encourage ourselves to focus on them. The fact that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam focused so much on these 10 days and encouraged us to focus on these 10 days. And he mentioned the hadith that in Ramadan there is a night that whoever is deprived of its khayr, then he said there's a night that's worth 1,000 months, meaning Laylatul Qadr, a night worth 1,000 months. Whoever is deprived of its khayr, of its good, then verily he is the deprived. The Prophet ﷺ focused on these last 10 days. He encouraged his Sahaba to focus on these last 10 days. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swore by these 10 days uh, in Surah Al-Fajr, wal fajr wal ayal al-Ashr, in the second verse of Surah Al-Fajr. Some of the scholars said this, these are the first 10 days of Dhul-Hijjah, and others say these are the 10 nights of, Dhul, uh, of Ramadan, and that is the last 10 nights of Ramadan, and that is the more correct opinion. So all of this shows us the status of these last 10 days. And the fact that these last 10 days have a night that is worth 1,000 months that we're supposed to strive to be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this time shows us the importance and focusing on the virtues of these last 10 days. When we look at the Salaf, the early Muslims and how they would focus on these last 10 days because they followed in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When they saw how he used to focus, when they saw how he used to encourage the Sahaba and then the Tabi'een and those, all of those who came after them, they would continue to increase even uh, during uh, following the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during these last 10 days. It's been narrated that Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, used to read the Qur'an during Ramadan. So if you look at in general, when Ramadan will come, the major scholars from the Salaf, from the early Muslim, their schedules will change, their focus will change. So much so, for example, Imam Malik, who is the Imam of Medina, the famous one who was teaching the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he used to uh, focus on reading the Qur'an when Ramadan came. He would stop teaching the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to focus on the Qur'an. And Imam al-Zuhri, also from the great Imams of Medina, he would say when Ramadan would enter, إِنَّمَا هُوَ إِطْعَامُ الطَّعَامُ وَقِرَاءَةُ الْقُرْآنِ That barely it's time now to feed the poor and to read the Qur'an. So that would be their focus during Ramadan. It was narrated that Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah used to read the Qur'an every Ramadan 60 times. That Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah used to read the Qur'an every Ramadan 60 times. That's six zero, not six. 60 times. So how many times did he read the Qur'an per day? I say about two times. So this number is huge. And some people say that's very difficult. Some people might even think it's almost impossible. And I remember that one of our scholars who taught us in Medina, Sheikh Muhammad al-Mukhtar al may Allah preserve him, he said he mentioned when he was in the beginning of his talab, of seeking knowledge, that he, he asked his father, he said, we see a lot of narrations where a lot of the Salaf, the early uh, scholars, would read the entire Qur'an in one night. But he said, it seems kind of difficult, almost impossible. So his father told him, he said, no, it's not. He said, if you concentrate and you do it, because he said, I myself have done it before where I opened up the Qur'an, and he said, I got into it, I was feeling it. And he said, then I found myself right before Fajr, I finished the entire Qur'an. He said, so I did it myself before. So it is possible. But he, Someone might ask now and say, why would uh, the scholars read so much when the Prophet ﷺ forbid us from finishing the Qur'an in less than three days? That's a good question. And to be honest with you, it's a question I always used to have before as well. I would, why would they read it in one day? Why would they read it in one day and not read it? Uh, in, in, in three days as the Prophet ﷺ prescribed, as he ordered. He told Abdullah ibn Amr to not read it in more than three days. So why now is the Prophet ﷺ, why are these, these great scholars, why are they reading the Qur'an in more than three days? And you see in front of you the, the narration you have on Fatada that he would recite the Qur'an outside of Ramadan every seven days he would finish. And during Ramadan, he would read it every three days. But during the last ten nights, he would finish the Qur'an at least once every night. So the question comes now, why would these scholars focus on this? 
when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us not to read the Qur'an in less than three days? It's a good question. It's something we need to ask ourselves. And the answer was given to us by Imam Ibn Rajib al-Hanbali rahimahullah when he mentioned uh, this story. He said the same question. He said this question comes to mind. Why would they do this when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbid to read the Qur'an in less than three days? And he said that what's meant by this nahi, or this, you know, being forbidden to read in more than three days, is when it comes to the mudawama ali, and he means continuously doing it, or doing it a lot. However, he said at special times, or special places, if you wanted to read the entire Quran during a special time like this in Ramadan, then the scholars see this being as okay because it's a special time. And he said also in special places, let's say for example, <coughs> if you were to go to Mecca, or go to Medina on Umrah, and you're know, saying, Alhamdulillah, I'm in a special place. I want to increase my ibadah in the Prophet's mosque, alayhi salatu salam, or in the, in the, in the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. So you say, I'm here for only two days. So let me read 15 Jews today and 50 Jews tomorrow. So here the scholars also said, uh, this is permissible to do this during this time. And when you look at how the scholars focused on these last 10 days and benefiting, not just when it came to the ibadah. The ibadah was very clear, and they would pray all night. And even nowadays, in the time we live in, by the way, you'll see the, you know, scholars, even sometimes the general Muslims who are really striving during these days, who are working hard during the nights. I remember, it was about two years ago, I went to Sudan, and I was uh, fasting the last ten days there in Sudan. And subhanAllah, I noticed that every day they're praying with one jizu after, uh, after tarawih. But I didn't think they would you know, try to do you know, too much in the qiyam later. Because they're praying two, two parts. They pray... Uh, a certain amount of rakats after Isha, and then they pray a certain amount during the night time. So I was thinking they're going to pray with another juzu, maybe, uh, you know, or a juzu and a half if they read a lot. And when I went to pray with them after we already prayed one juzu at night, I found that they were praying three juzus, mashallah, to barakah during the night. So they finished the Quran twice during Ramadan. And mashallah, the people are making atikaf, and the people are always in the masjid. So people will strive even during the days that we live in. But one of the things I want you to focus on this that the early uh, scholars would focus on is preparing themselves to beautify themselves for these last 10 days. When it comes to their garments, some of them would buy new clothes, new thobes to wear. They buy new thobes, and some of them would wear, wear their best of clothes. They would make sure that they, you know, they took the ghusl and that they, you know, put their perfume on and all, and all of this. Just like you're preparing for Juma or for Eid. The same type of preparation to focus on this by wearing the best, and sometimes even buying new things. They would focus on doing this during the last 10 days in order to show the greatness of this time and prepare to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hoping to be standing and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during a night that is better than 1,000 months. Tayyip, the question comes now about the night of Qadr. The night of Qadr and we want to know the status of it and to determine when it is and some of the signs that show us, and what are the best deeds that we need to be doing during the night of Qadr. <clears throat> and with the status of Laylatul Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Qur'an, إِنَّ أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرُ مَا The greatness of this night, it's better than 1,000 months. And that means, if you were to do the math, that if you're to be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this blessed night, that you will be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 83 years and 4 months. Pay attention to that. 83 years and 4 months worth of worship just in one night. Allah Akbar. Look at the blessing of this night. It was narrated that the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi that Imam Malik rahimullah said that he learned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi had said that the reason behind this, that he had seen the lifespan of the past nations. The past nations used to live longer than us. If you remember in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described Nuh alayhi salam, Prophet Nuh, that he was giving da'wah to his people for 950 years. 950 years. Allah Akbar. Just giving da'wah. He lived how, how long before that? He lived how long after that? So it shows you that their lifespans were much longer than us. That means that they had the opportunity to do more ibadah and more worship than us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our lifespans are shorter. However, He replaced with us this great night of Laylatul Qadr, the night of Qadr, or the night of power, in order to uh, be able to gain the same type of reward 
to raise our levels, inshallah ta'ala, in the Jannah and the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from the people of Jannah and protect us all from the hellfire during this blessed month, Ya Rabbil Alameen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith, as we mentioned earlier, he said that this night, the night of Qadr, he said it's better than 1,000 months. مَنْ حُرِمَ خَيْرُهَا فَقَدْ حُرِمَ That whoever is the, it doesn't get the khayr from this night, then he is obviously the one who is hurim, that has made the khayr is haram for him. He's been deprived. He's deprived himself because he didn't focus on worshipping and blew the opportunity to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to that which is equivalent of 83 years and 4 months. And let's be honest with ourselves and we sit here today and we prepare. What if it was something of the dunya, some of the affairs of the dunya, and it was about money, and you were to make, you know, 83,400 off of the sale that you were about to make during that night, would you see? Let's be honest. I want all of you to reflect on that right now. If you were to, to make a sale worth $83,400, and you could be a millionaire, and still $83,400 is a lot of money, even people who have money. That's a, that's a good sale for one night, okay? What if it were to be 830,400 or, or millions? Would you go to sleep or would you be lazy during that night or would you be striving to make that sale? Would you make sure that you're, you're sitting next to your telephone waiting for it to ring so you can get that sale? You wouldn't waste any time. But why now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the opportunity to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gain this great azure, we're lazy, we, you know, we don't do what we should do, we sleep so much during these nights, subhanAllah. So this is something you need to remind yourself. This will encourage you as well during these nights to focus more on your ibadah, inshallah ta'ala. When you look at the blessing of Laylatul Qadr, the scholars mention several things. I will mention quickly, you know, seven or eight of the benefits that show the virtues of this night. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Qur'an down during Laylatul Qadr. The Qur'an, when it was sent down, it was sent down during this night. The first ayah that came during the, the, was, it was to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Prophet sallam, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was during Ramadan. But the Qur'an was sent down during this blessed month. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْمُبَارَكِ And another verse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Qur'an down during the night of Laylatul Qadr. Also, this is the night where all of the risk and the, 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 the risk that you will be, the provisions you will be getting throughout the year and all of the good that will happen to you, all of the qadr that will happen to you throughout the year, it is passed out to the angels during this blessed night. The angels will receive their orders to protect you, receive what's going to happen to you during this year, uh, the qadr that's going to happen to you, all of their duties, they receive it during this night. Also, it's a blessed night. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the verse, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةٍ مُبَارَكَ That verily we have revealed it, a the Qur'an, and a blessed night. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this month better than 1,000 months. It's also from the great virtues. And the fact that the angels, تَتَنَزَّلُوا الْمَلَائِكَ فِيهَا وَالْرُوح That the angels and the ruh, and the meaning of ruh in the verse is Jibreel alayhi salam, that they come down during this night because it's a blessed night. And also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it as a peaceful night. Salamun hiya hatta matla'il fajr That it is uh, peaceful until the time of the fajr, so it's a peaceful night. And whoever fasts, or whoever is praying during this night, as the Prophet said, that all of his past sins will be forgiven. And obviously the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down an entire surah about it shows us the greatness of this night. So here's eight points that show us the status and the importance of Laylatul Qadr. And take it as a general ruling in Islam. Whenever something has that much focus, or is putting you know, that much importance on it, it's something you really need to focus on yourself as a Muslim. So this is something very deep. All of these things we mentioned are just eight points. Some scholars mention even more about the fadl or the virtues of Layat al-Qadr. When something has that many virtues, this is something very, very important we need to focus on. If you look, for example, one of the small surahs in the Qur'an, and we're not going to give the examples, but we're just going to give the, the example of the surah itself, is Surah Al-Fatiha. If you want to go reflect now on the virtues of Surah Al-Fatiha, you will find that they're numerous and so much. The Prophet ﷺ focused so much on the status and the virtues of Surah Al-Fatiha. So the Surah is something we have to f focus on it. 
not just something we read as a custom 17 times a day or more, but something that's very, very deep that we need to focus on. And like this is this night of Layatul Qadr. So what are some of the signs <coughs> that helps us know when is Layatul Qadr? And what is the benefit in knowing these signs? Because one might ask, why do we know these signs? What's the benefit in knowing the signs of Laylatul Qadr? The scholars mention that from the benefits of knowing Laylatul Qadr, and there's two types of signs, first of all. The signs that happen during the night of, of Qadr, and signs that happen after it finishes, meaning after the Fajr time. So the first signs during that night, the scholars mention, and Imam Anoui mentioned this in his explanation of Sahih Muslim, where he said that the first type Though the signs that are happening during the night of Qadr, he said this is a way to encourage the, the people, to encourage them to continue in their ibadah, to strive harder in their ibadah. Because when you see some of these signs, oh, this could be it. So it's going to encourage you. And he said also it's a, it's a way for those who uh, are, are, are not focusing to see the time that they're, they're wasting. The time is being wasted, so obviously they can focus uh, more and benefit from the night, inshallah ta'ala. So these signs happened during the night. Some of them were mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah which were that the night, it's a clear night. And that the qamar, that the, the, that the moon is very clear. However, it's going to come in another hadith, which is uh, in Sahih Muslim, that it's going to be in a state of, of, of whining where it's going to be, you know, at the end of the month. So it's not going to be the full moon is what it means. It's going to be part of the moon, but that part of the moon is going to be very, very clear during that night. Uh, these are, this is also one of the signs. And from the signs is that it is a peaceful night. Allah mentioned that in the Quran as well. It's also mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also that it's usually not too cold or too hot during that night. And it's fun, like, even if you're in a country that's cold, you'll find that it wouldn't be that cold during that. You, you'll find a change in the weather. So that's usually the, these are usually some of the signs of Laylatul Qadr to know that it's happened. After the Fajr, there's another sign, which is that when the sun comes out, it doesn't have any rays on it. You won't see the rays sticking out too much from the sun. It'll be the regular sun, but it won't, the rays won't be coming out on the sides. And SubhanAllah, we've seen that time and time again when those brothers, mashallah, may Allah bless them, who follow, even ourselves, when we follow, and we see that the night that comes on Laylatul Qadr that you'll see the moon or, or the, uh, after that, or the sun won't have, uh, the sun after, uh, after Fajr won't have the, the rays on it, and subhanAllah, that, is, uh, it, that increases our iman, subhanAllah, as Muslims. When you have signs like this, mentioned by Rasulullah sallallahu and actually you see it during these blessed nights, Allah. <coughs> when is Laylatul Qadr? And I want you to pay attention to this question, because we have a problem as an ummah that we've been trained to believe that it's the 27th. And we only focus on the 27th sometimes. That's why you find you can't find a spot in the masjid on the 27th night. So when is Laylatul Qadr? First of all, the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which came in both Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, that it's during the last 10 days of Ramadan. So that we have confirmed, that it's during the last 10 days of Ramadan. And another hadith, which came in Sahih al-Bukhari, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us to focus on Laylatul Qadr, meaning being in, in, in worship and, and, and striving during these nights, to focus on Laylatul Qadr during the last 10 days, or the, the Otar, meaning the odd nights of Laylatul Qadr. To focus on the odd nights of Laylatul Qadr, meaning to focus on the 21st night, the 23rd night, the 25th, 27th, and 29th to focus on these five nights more so than the odd nights. In another hadith, the third hadith, which is in Sahih Muslim, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us to focus on the last ten days, but those who become weak from us and don't have the ability to do so, he said, then don't let, and to make sure he focuses on the last seven of the, of the odd nights. Pay attention that he focused on the last seven of the odd nights. So he'll, far, he'll, he'll start from uh, after that, from the 23rd on, where he'll focus on the 23rd, 25th, 27th, 29th. Uh, these will be the main focus. And another hadith, which also came in Sahih Muslim, which is uh, another hadith with the statement of 
uh, Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu. And Ubay ibn Ka'ab, he said that verily I know what it is, and he said it is the 27th, and he said this night Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, told us to pray this night, that he commanded us to pray this night, the night of the 27th. And as the scholars mentioned, because this might be confusing, so okay, it is the 27th, but it's not, because it's been confirmed time and time again that it comes on other nights. And when you look at all of the hadith, when you look at all of the hadith, we gain from these hadith, I mentioned four hadith now, either in Bukhari Muslim or in Bukhari or Muslim by itself, so they're in, in one of the, uh, of the two collections, that we gain from these four hadith that it's during the last ten days, that's clear cut. And that most likely, it's better that we focus, it's important that we focus on the odd nights. And more so it's going to be during, during the last seven of the odd nights. And a lot of the time it's going to be on the 27th. But the correct opinion, as the scholars mentioned, such as even Hajar and others, rahimahullah, is that it changes from night to night. Meaning, this year it could be on the 21st. But last year it could have been the 25th. Next year it's the 27th. And then it comes on the 27th once again. And then it comes on the 29th. So it changes all the time. And all of the years I've been Muslim, for over 22 years now, all the time I pray Ramadan, and we find that it's always changing, alhamdulillah. It's never on the 27th only. It could happen more on the 27th, but a lot of the other nights it happens on other nights. And the hikmah, the wisdom behind this, not being known, and by moving from night to night, should be clear to all of us. Because all of us know, we have to be honest with ourselves, if it was one clear night, we would be lazy. We take nine nights off, and we sleep, and we sit in front of the TV, and then if it was just the 27th, like people do now, and thinking that's the night, and we would stand only during the night 27th. So don't let shaitan fool you thinking that this is the only night, because it's alhamdulillah, it could be any of the nights of the last 10 days, but it's most likely on the odd nights. So pay attention to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these nights, and don't lose the reward of being in the state of worship. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and a night that's worth 83, I mean, it's amazing, it's fun, I just say the number, 1,000 months, 83 years and, 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 and four months, Allah Akbar. Like, what should we be doing during this night? This comes with the question a lot. What are the things that we should be focusing on during the night of Qadr? The question comes a lot. And what's important, obviously, is that we follow in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we focus on the things that he used to focus on, we focus on the things the Sahaba and the early scholars used to focus on as well. And that is clear, obviously, when it comes to the night prayer. That we pray the night prayer, and it's better that we pray with the Imam. And if you pray with the Imam, Alhamdulillah, you have the opportunity now, to, and I want you to pay attention to this, because I'm going to give you two opportunities to have written for you down that you pray the entire night. That Ajab. So if you look at the night, if it's uh, nine hours where you are, or ten hours where you are, you're going to have the reward written down for you in your book of good deeds, inshallah, yawm al-qiyamah, like you prayed the entire night. You have two opportunities to do it, alhamdulillah, and, and so focus on this. The first one is obviously praying with the imam until he finishes. Praying with the imam until he finishes. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever prays with the imam until he finishes, that it's written for him as if he has prayed the, the entire night. Okay? So, what's important for you now, uh, the, the Qiyamah is written for you like you're praying the entire night. What's important is that you pray to the end. Focus on to the end. Because what some brothers do, they pray eight rakats, they pray six rakats, and then they come and they leave early. Okay? Or they don't finish with the Imam. Some people say, Yaqi, it's a problem that our Imam, he prays with him. I don't want to pray with him. If he prays with her, you pray with her with him, and you get up and you pray another rakah. What? Pay attention. Pay attention to this. So what's going to happen is you're going to be in the 11th rakah if the imam is following the sunnah when he prays, or if the one prays 20 or 23, you'll be with him. If he's going to make witr in the first part of the night and not leave it to the last part of the night, which he should, because it's better we leave the witr to the last part of the night during the last 10 days especially. If he gets up and prays the 11th rakah after he gives the salams, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, you stand up and you add on one rakah to make it what? Uh, shafa instead of witr. And then you can pray your witr later by yourself. But there's also something important to point out which people don't know. And we tell people all the time, people are like, oh really? I didn't know that. What is forbidden when it comes to the night prayer is to make two witrs in one night. 
what's forbidden in night prayer is to pray two witters in, in one night. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا وطراني في الليل That there's no two witters in one night. So you're allowed to pray uh, witter in the beginning of the night, and then you can pray nafil throughout the night. You can pray two rakats more, four, ten, twenty rakats more, whatever you have the strength to do. But you don't pray another witter if you already prayed in the beginning of the night. But you can pray nafil, voluntary prayer, throughout the night, as long as you do not pray another witter. So this is allowed. Alhamdulillah, when it comes to the limit, it's better only to pray uh, 11 rakats during the night. However, during the, these last 10 days, you might want to increase and want to pray more. And some people say, no, no, you can't because the sunnah is to pray 11. But alhamdulillah, we know from the other hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he said, salatul layl methna methna. That the night prayer is in pairs of two. Two, two, two. And he said, if one of you is scared that the fajr is going to come out, then he should make one raka'ah with him. So the scholars took from this that the night prayer is unlimited. You can pray as many as you want. And this is encouraging for us, especially for those who find strength and pleasure and the prayer that he focused on this during the last 10 days. The other things we need to focus on, obviously, reading the Quran, making dhikr, uh, making istighfar, anything you, you want to do that's a good deed, even if it's reading a book, an Islamic book, anything that's a good deed. Because sometimes people find it difficult to continue at one pace, so it's important that we change up and do other things as well in order to keep going throughout the night. And one of the key du'as that we need to focus on during these last ten nights is the du'a taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Aisha radiallahu anha when she said, what should I say when I'm, when I'm searching for Laylatul Qadr? What should I say? What, give me a du'a that I say. And he said to her, uh, alayhi salam radiallahu anha, to say, Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'fu anni. Allahumma this is the dua that we need to memorize in Arabic and we need to repeat it throughout the nights. A lot of times people find themselves being lazy. Alhamdulillah, even if you're kicking back on the couch, you could be saying this dua. The sisters who are busy in the house and they're tired, also they could be saying this during, throughout the night, inshallah, getting the ajr. But what's important when we focus on this dua is you need to focus on the meaning behind the dua, the meaning in the words. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't just teach us something just to say it, to sit there and repeat and repeat and have no ma'na, have, no ma have no meaning behind it. There has to be meaning behind what's being said. So you have to focus on the meanings. What does this mean? To say, Allahumma innaka afuun. Oh Allah, barely you are the all-forgiving. You are the all-forgiving. You love to forgive, so forgive me, Allah. You need to feel that meaning when you say it. It needs to, it needs to pierce your heart when you say, Oh Allah, you are the all-forgiving. Allah is the only one who can forgive your sins. Who can forgive the sins other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We need to feel this during that night. And this is going to take your worship during Laylatul Qadr when you really feel this dua. You focus on the meaning and from the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-afu, that he's the one who is the all-forgiving subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to forgive, to hibbu al-afu, that you love to forgive. Wallahu yuridu ay yutub alaykum. Allah wants to repent upon you. You remember this, Allah wants to forgive you. And you feel it, you say, oh Allah, not just to repeat it. Because like, what happens sometimes, people just repeat the things really fast. Like when we're doing the istighfar, so we're doing it a hundred times, Yaqeen. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do a hundred times. Another narration, seven times. So we're doing it a hundred times, Yaqeen. What's the benefit? Oh, Yaqeen, alhamdulillah, I follow the sunnah, and I said, istighfar Allah a hundred times, Allah Akbar. Now he comes now, and he says, Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulillah. What is that? Is there, see, Yaqeen, alhamdulillah, I did the sunnah, I finished. But was there any benefit? Did you feel it? Because the dhikr that's on the tongue, and you don't feel it in the heart, well, there's not really much benefit in it. Alhamdulillah, you're doing a good deed by making it, but sometimes it could be a joke if you make it too fast. But you want to feel it. You want to feel the dhikr inside. So when you're saying, stop for Allah, and you, you're feeling it when you say it, feel in your heart, yes, I'm repenting. I, I, I need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this is the far from me. So I'm, I'm putting focus. It's not just, it's not just, you know, there's concentration involved in it. Stop for Allah. Stop for Allah. Stop for Allah. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it when I'm saying it. I'm not just 
you know, stuff a lot, stuff a lot, stuff a lot. Or some, you have these guys, sometimes we have the, the dicker beads and, the, and they're going really fast, stuff a lot, stuff a lot, stuff a lot, stuff a lot. Stuff a lot. This is not something that's going to benefit you because the thicker that's just on the tongue, it doesn't affect the heart. There's no benefit in it. So we need to reflect on this. Allahumma innaka afu tuhibbu al-afu. Oh Allah, you're the all-forgiving. You love to forgive. This is who you are. This is your 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 your, your beautiful name and afu, and this is your attribute that you love to forgive. So forgive me. Fa'fu anni. Fa'fu anni. So forgive me, Allah. This is who you are. I'm the sinner. I'm the one who is in need of you. So we need to feel this. We need to feel this thicker as we're saying it. And that's why, I mean, when you reflect on oh, this thicker, it's very deep. It's not just a coincidence that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only taught this dua to Aisha radiallahu anha. And he didn't teach any other duas for this blessed night when we're searching for the night of the Qadr. To focus on this dua. And also, what's going to happen if we focus on this dua? And it's, 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 it's piercing in our hearts. It's, it's in there. It's affecting our hearts. And we're making now pure tawbah because we're feeling it. And we're repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you're feeling it, then the iman starts to what? Increase. Your attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is boosting. Your desire for the akhirah, for, for the jannah, is getting stronger. So as you're making this dua, and you're being, you were a bit lazy in the beginning, you, you, did, you couldn't make any, you weren't reading the Quran properly, you weren't, you know, you get up. You make a fresh wudu, you know, to to have a new wudu, maybe to also give you a little no more energy, and then you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah. And imagine the difference now when this 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 dhikr has affected your heart, the effect now of the salat. Now you're really gonna be focusing on what you're saying, on what you're doing. When you go down to the sujood and you make your dua and you ask Allah to forgive you once again, and you ask Allah for the best of this world and of the next, and you really beg on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're going to feel the effect. This dua will take you to that level, inshallah. And then when you finish, you come and you open up the Quran. Bismillah. Bismillah rahman rahim And you start to read. You start to feel it now because the heart is pure. So this dua is very deep. When you focus on the meaning of it and acting upon it and feeling it in your life. And that's why this was the only dua that was taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Aisha radiallahu anha. Tayyip, the question comes now about making i'tikaf and how to benefit from i'tikaf and perhaps we can do before that how to benefit from this night in general. We mentioned some of the things now but let's go a little more in depth on how to benefit from these last 10 days and this is the main goal of what we're doing this lesson today is to how, how we can benefit and you see here I put for you something very small on this slide. We have something very small, which is the preparation. The key to maximizing our benefit, maximizing our ibadah during these last 10 days, it all comes back to the preparation. The preparation is the key to the start, and then obviously, once you get in, to actually act. But the preparation is the key to benefit, to be prepared once you enter into the door of the last 10 days. And then obviously, you have things that are going to help you continue down the path and be consistent during the last 10 days in Shalotana. So the key of preparing starts with a mental preparation. The key to preparing starts with a mental preparation. What do I mean by a mental preparation? First of all, that your heart is ready and that your mind is focused. Your mind is focused about what you're about to enter into. And I want you to reflect sometimes on the dunya. Some of the People who are like athletes, for example. Look at some of the athletes before the game. You see them. You know what I'm talking about. A lot of you now who, who watch sports, you have that athlete in your head. Maybe they have their headphones on. They like their music. They like, But what they're doing, they're getting into the zone. You see, he's focused. He's focused. He's getting in the zone. He's mentally getting ready. The fighter, the boxer, before he goes in the ring, he's mentally getting ready. Because the mental aspect is the key to success. So they're focusing on the mental the mental side, getting into the game. Also us, as we're about to enter these last 10 days, we have to focus also on the mental side of it. Getting ready, our mind ready, knowing what we're about to get into, knowing the greatness of these last 10 days, having our hearts attached to these last 10 days, having our hearts yearning 
to benefit from these last 10 days. And then focusing on the importance of our niya. Focusing on the niya that we're only going to do this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And focusing on how much we need these days. How much we need to have our sins forgiven. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to us, Man qama laylat al-qadr imana wa ihtisaba ghufira lahu ma taqadda min dhambi. That whoever stands in prayer during the night of Qadr through his Iman, there's two conditions, pay attention. Not just stand in prayer and you're thinking outside and you're not focusing. There's conditions for this prayer. That it's through your Iman, your faith, and through your Ihtisab. And your Ihtisab meaning that you want the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your heart's attached to Allah to get this reward from Him. You really, really want it. You have this strong desire, this strong niya, this pure niya, pure intention. So, we're mentally focusing on how to get our sins forgiven through our ibadah, through our qiyam. Have to make sure we have a pure niya. We're, we're praying all night. People say, mashallah, mashallah, look at, look at the shaykh or look at the brother or the sister. They're praying all through the night and they're reading a lot of Quran. They're reading three juzus in it. Shaytan comes and ruins everything for you. You have to be ready, mentally ready to get come into these last 10 days. And then you have to convince yourself <coughs> that by talking to your nafs, your soul, because the soul is lazy. It wants you to not do it. Shaitan's gonna whisper to you, Allah is the full Rahim, Allah is the all forgiving, all merciful. Let's just take it easy. You know, no need to put too much. Allah knows, you know, you don't have to strive too hard. So you have to convince yourself and convince your soul about the importance of what you're gonna get in return. I'm gonna be worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this night. All of you sit down now. Let, let's say, for example, that you've had some bad Ramadans over your life. Let's say you had two or three good last 10 days. You had five, 10, five, let's say. And then you were to come and your age now is 40 years old. And you live into your 80. And that's 40 years plus the five you had in the past that were good. 45 years of 1,000 months. How much is that? Allah Adam, maybe we'll die this Ramadan. We don't know how long we're gonna live. But let's say we live 40 years more and we, each year we get ourselves into this zone, into this, into this mental uh, you know, stage where we're, we're getting ready for Ramadan, subhanAllah. Imagine how much good and khair are we gonna have in our scale of good deeds, Yom Al-Qiyamah. Look at the, this amazing reward. So we're getting ourselves mentally ready. Even we know that we're gonna face some difficulties. It's gonna be tiring. It's not easy to stay awake for the entire night. It's not easy to stay awake for most of the night. Sometimes we have to go to work, but wallahi, I can guarantee you. And I've seen this, and it's something I've experienced myself, time and time again, that wallahi, when you strive, sometimes after Salat al-Fajr, you sleep for two hours, two and a half hours. And you wake up, and you go to work, and you work just fine. You've been awake all night. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives you barakah, blessing. Allah gives you quwa, He gives you strength. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because you strove for Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us in the Quran, he says, That verily those who strive for us, verily we will guide them to our ways. And verily Allah will be with the doers of good. Verily Allah will be with the doers of good, alhamdulillah. So Allah is going to be with us, He's going to support us. It's going to be difficult. We're going to go through some, uh, some tiredness. Uh, shaitan is going to try to whisper to us. Not the big shaitan, don't get confused. The big shaitans are... are, are or, t or locked down still, they're shackled down. But his, his troops are still out there whispering to the people. So they're going to try to encourage us not to benefit from these last 10 days. So we need to convince ourselves. <clears throat> and one of the keys, the mental keys to success during this, these last 10 days as we prepare is not to cry over spilled milk. Meaning, what happened in the past of Ramadan, alhamdulillah, it happened. Because you're one of two people or one of three people when it comes to what happened in the last... 17 or so days during Ramadan, before you enter the last 10 days. You're either somebody who was striving, mashallah to barakallah. You were doing what you were supposed to do, reading the Quran, praying, protecting your fast, safeguarding your fast, all of this. Or you're somebody who was lazy, shortcomings, wasn't doing what you're supposed to do. Or somebody's in the middle. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, one day like this, one day like that. So you fall into one of these three categories. But what is significant now is not what you did in the past, it's how you go out. And that's one of the blessed, blessing things of these last 10 days. It's how you finish Ramadan. And that's why another one of the hikmas, the wisdoms, 
being mentioned about these last 10 days, the focus being put on these last 10 days, is so we know, uh, so we, we, it's about how we go out, how we finish. Because if we're just in the beginning, we'd be lazy for the next 20 days. But alhamdulillah, the focus, the most important thing is on how you go out, how you finish Ramadan. So alhamdulillah, you still have the opportunity. If you've been striving, you have to continue. If you're somebody who has shortcomings, alhamdulillah, now it's time to make up for it before it's too late and you regret it Yomul Qiyam when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing that's going to help us, and we have about three days now until we enter, is that we prepare anything. And I tell my family this all of the time. And I advise my brothers and sisters with this every single year. Do not fall into the trap of shaitan where you're going to the marketplace and you're buying things for Eid and buying things for the last 10 days during these blessed nights. If you have something to do, do it now. Go to your wife today. Huh? Say, here you go. Here's the pen. Here's the paper. Write for me what you need. The sister tells the husband, what do you want us to do for Eid for the last night? Let's write it down now. Let's go do it these last two or three nights before the, the ten days come in because we're not going to leave the house. We're going to be in the masjid or be in our house worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not going to let shaitan fool us by going to the market. Go to the, to the supermarket. Buy your food for two weeks. It's enough for the last ten days and the first few days of Eid. Have all of the food you need, all of the things you need. You need to buy some new clothes for, for Eid, some new shoes. Do it now. Don't let shaitan fool you. It's so despicable how the Muslim countries become so active. You go to some of the marketplaces, Wallah al it's like you're going for Hajj. It's so crowded. What have you been doing for the last 20 days? It would have been much more beneficial to not waste these 10 days. But Shaytan comes and fools us, makes us lazy, and at the last minute we come. And sometimes, subhanAllah, even during the night of the 27th, we'll find that the people are in the marketplace buying Wallah al -Mustan. The last thing we're going to mention from the mental side of it, and the preparation, is and that's part of the, actually the planning as well, the next part we're going to talk about how to plan for yourself, is that we need to cut off everything which comes between us and the benefiting from these days. Whether that's going to the marketplace, whether it's this device which destroys all of us in our lives, it's the focus on the telephone during these last, turn the telephone off during these last night. Turn it on, bismillah, tell anybody who's close to you, my phone is going to be on flight mode, okay? This is a, a commitment I'm trying to make to myself. I know it's difficult with life. Because even like myself now, I use my phone for khayr. Good, I'm not, I don't play Candy Crush. And those of you who invite me to Candy Crush, may Allah guide you, because my name starts with A, B. <laughs> and the brothers and sisters always send me, uh, I'm the first guy on their Facebook list, so they send me a request to play Candy Crush. Do I look like somebody who plays Candy Crush? I, I, I wish I had time. Some people, they look like they're into it, but alhamdulillah, I don't have time, alhamdulillah. We're we'll focused on better things. But we want to focus even on more better things during these last 10 days. Let's try to make a commitment to ourselves to at least turn it off. Okay, maybe yeah, we, we, or we turn it off for a few hours, turn it back on, answer some important things. That's if you have to answer it. But if you don't, and most of us, wallahi, wallahi, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't have to answer it. We want to answer it. This is the problem. We follow our whole, we follow our desires. <coughs> so we focus on putting the telephones away, turning the TVs off, put a sheet on top of the TV, cover up your computer. Put your laptop away, put it on the top shelf. Don't use it during these last 10 days or just use it during the daytime. Do not waste these beautiful nights, the last 10 nights of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. Like from the planning we need to do, we need to set our goals. See exactly what it is we want to do. And here each one of us has a strong point that we need to focus on. And this is very important because the question always comes, what is the best act of worship? No doubt it's better, the best thing is to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi by praying a long prayer with long sujood and long rukur, reciting the Qur'an, making dhikr. These are the things we need to be doing. However, each one of us differs. You'll find somebody who can sit and they make very beautiful dhikr. And, you know, you, you see them, they have this tranquility. And they're sitting there, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allah, la ilaha illallah. And he's feeling these words. What does subhanAllah mean? Does alhamdulillah, Allah, for the greatness of Allah subhanAllah. La ilaha illallah. So he, he's, you can, he's feeling, he's living with the thicket. So we say this person, it's better for him to focus on the thicket more. Pay attention to that. Say, pay, pay attention to that. Because sahih, the prayer is very, very important. We need to pray, and the best thing is that we do a little bit of everything. We pray a little bit, and then make some thicket, read some Quran, might go back and pray a little bit, and then we come and make some dua, 
and we're doing different things throughout the night. Because what happens sometimes, you try to focus on one thing, you burn out. But when you do different things and focus on different things, it, it, it enables you, alhamdulillah, to, uh, to have strength in, in, in your ibadah, inshallah, during these nights. But after you focus on the salat and, and do a bit of everything, after that, it's key that you focus on the area that you're strong in. So one sister, mashallah, she's very strong in the Quran. And she recites the Quran, mashallah, tabarakallah, one jizu, two jizu, three jizu, and one sitting. Then we say, focus on the Quran during these nights because the strong part you, ha you have, it's going to help you do more. That's very, very important. And Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah and other, uh, other scholars mention as a principle that when it comes to ibadat, a lot of times you have to ask yourself where your heart is. What do you feel comfortable in? So if somebody now, and this also when it comes to the spots, for example, when, when somebody comes to, to you and says that I feel more comfortable praying at home or I feel more comfortable praying in this masjid, if you do it and your ibadah is at another level, we can say that can be better for you. Pay attention to that. Sahih, it's encouraged to go and pray with the congregation and this encourage you. And like a brother told me last night, we had a, a question and answer session. He was saying that, uh, you know, he said, I always promise that I'm going to do it in my house and never do it. So sometimes shaitan gets you. But it's, if you are somebody who benefits in the house, I know some of my scholars, some of my close friends from the scholars as well, <coughs> who don't like to pray the tarawih and the qiyam in the masjid because they pray with themselves three or uh, three, three jizus, five jizus, seven jizus or more. They pray by themselves. And subhanAllah, they um, make long sujood and, and, and long rukur. And they say, you know, in the masjid, it's, it's too fast for me. SubhanAllah. So that's if that's what you find. You find your heart there, and that's what you need to focus on. And this is one of the true, true keys to success during these last 10 days is to focus on where you find your heart. That good deed, hold on to it. Do some other things so you don't burn out, and so you have Azure from here, from here, from here. But at the same time, focus on your strong point in order to make you, inshallah, be from those who are worshiping and striving during these last 10 days, and hopefully during the night of Qadr as well, inshallah ta'ala. Um, also, from the things we need to focus on in our planning is making sure that we don't neglect our fam families. We learn from the, the, the Sunnah of Rasulullah is that he used to wake up his family. And like we said, no matter how small it might be, even the young children, if they want to go to bed, say, no, 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 we have to pray a little bit. Let's come and read one page of the Quran. <laughs> He's only four or five years old, but you're encouraging him and you're putting it into his head and you're training him from a young age that, hey, look, these are the last 10 days of Ramadan. They're special, the last nights. So we want to read a little bit of Quran. We want to make some dhikr together before you go to bed at night. Maybe you used to say, read a bedtime story to your child. Now, you're going to what? You're going to read a, some Quran to them. You're going to make some dhikr with them. You're going to teach them from a young age. See, look at this beautiful dua that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa taught his wife Aisha radiallahu anha. <coughs> Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afa fa'fu anni. You teach them this. You teach them the meanings. And... Their hearts become attached from a young age with this beautiful, uh, these beautiful 10 days and with the night of Layl al Qadr as well. And the last point we'll mention is, and, and how to benefit from this, and because a lot of times we hear the stories of those striving and we feel we're weak. Uh, you know, the sisters sometimes complain they're working all day, they're taking care of the kids, and we always get this question, is that you do your best. The key is that you do your best and you have a strong intention that you want, Allah, you want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of your ability, that you want Allah to accept it from you. And Allah, He knows your intention. So you do your best. You strive to do as much as you can. Some people say, I can't stay awake for the entire night. I fall asleep. They, still, do, do as much as you can. And if you're, if you're taking away the devices, the telephone devices and the computer, what have you, and you're striving, even if it's only for a few hours, but it's pure and it's good, inshallah ta'ala, Allah will accept from you and He will put barak and blessings and much reward in your efforts as he knows your intentions, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before we go over to the questions, we finished the first hour, alhamdulillah. We still have one hour left. Um, we have two topics which we need to cover uh, quickly, and these are fiqh issues. Now we've determined how we're going to benefit from these last 10 days, but also in order to benefit, there's certain issues that we have to know which comes from the, uh, the fiqh side of it, and what we should be doing when it regards to our etikaf and then to our zakat, our zakat al fitr which comes at the end of Ramadan as well. And then we'll turn it over to uh, the questions that you have in Shalom
when it comes to i'tikaf, what is the meaning of i'tikaf? I'tikaf is to seclude yourself and to isolate yourself in the masjid, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To isolate yourself in the masjid, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not something that you must do, <coughs> but it's something you should do if you have the ability to do so. And the Prophet sallallahu as Aisha radiallahu anha said, that he would make the itikaf in the last 10 days of Ramadan until he passed away from this dunya. And then after that, his wives continued to make itikaf after him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now there are certain conditions that must be met if you're going to make i'tikaf. And obviously the scholars always mention the fact of being a Muslim and they mention also the issue here of i'tikaf of being uh, Mumayyiz, meaning uh, and someone who's sane and Mumayyiz. Mumayyiz, you don't have to be somebody who has reached puberty, pay attention to that. As long as he's somebody who's made, he, he knows what's happening, seven year old, eight year old, whatever, but he's somebody who's not going to be running around the masjid climbing on things, but he comes in with his father for example and he's worshipping, he's doing good things, but he hasn't reached the age of puberty, alhamdulillah, he can make i'tikaf in ta'ala. <coughs> in the issue of the niyyah, making sure that the niyyah is correct and you know what you're, you're doing, you know the rulings of your i'tikaf and you, you're striving to get the reward from Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also from the conditions that the, is that it's in a masjid. And the question comes a lot, can we do it in the house? And the answer is no. It has to be in the masjid. For it to be a correct i'tikaf, it must be in a masjid. And for the brothers, it must be, because it's for brothers and sisters, that it must be in a masjid where there's another condition where the five daily prayers are prayed. So if it's in a prayer room where they only pray the or something like that, it wouldn't be acceptable for the brothers. Some scholars say it's okay with the sisters, but it's really not recommended to be in a masjid where no people are going anyway, so that wouldn't be something good. It should be in a masjid which is active, people coming in and out, especially for the sisters. But for the brothers, it must be in a masjid where the five daily prayers are being prayed, and it's recommended, it's better if that masjid has Juma as well, so you wouldn't have to come out. But some countries, for example, uh, you might not have that ability, so it's okay to pray or to make atikab in a masjid that doesn't have Juma, but it has the five daily prayers, and then you go out to the prayer room or wherever because of the amount of people coming for Juma, they have to go out, they have to rent another place, so that's no problem in Shalotana. So these are the main conditions that must be met, and the last condition that the scholars mentioned is obviously that we are not in the state of impurity, meaning the big impurity, not making wudu. Obviously, we're, we're going to lose our wudu during anti-cap several times. We're talking about the issue of the ghusl, the issue of the ghusl, uh, or if the sister obviously is in her minsis, she's not allowed to make anti-cap in the masjid. Or if the brother's in the state of Janaba, where he's junub, where he has needs to make a major ghusl, whether he had been with his wife or he had uh, had, had had a dream that he must obviously make ghusl to be in the state of i'tikaf and Allah knows best. So these are the main conditions that the scholars mention. And also the issue of the timing. When is i'tikaf? The timing of i'tikaf and when it is. The start of i'tikaf, by the way, i'tikaf can be any time during the year. And it's something we don't realize. That it can be any time during the year i'tikaf. It doesn't have to be in Ramadan. And it doesn't have to be in the last 10 days of Ramadan. And you can even make i'tikaf for all 30 days. You can make i'tikaf uh, from the beginning of Ramadan to the end. But the best time to make i'tikaf is the last 10 days of Ramadan. And the Prophet wasallam. this is what he would do. He would focus on entering uh, the i'tikaf on the, the, night of the, 20, the morning time of the night of the 21st. And he would enter into the i'tikaf and he would stay for the last 10 days. So this is the best time when it should be. And there's another important issue, which is, what is the most time you must make itikaf and the less time you can make itikaf? Because a lot of people think, if I can't make it for the 10 days, then I can't make it. But that's not correct. You can make itikaf for half of the last 10 days. You can make it for the last five days or the first five days. You can make itikaf for three days. You can make it for one day. In fact, when it comes to the aqal, the less amount of itikaf allowed, the scholars differ. And some of them said 10 days, some of them said this, but the two strongest opinions of the scholars when it comes to the less amount of i'tikaf allowed is first of all the first opinion is that it can be no less than either one night or one day one of the two one night or one day another opinion from the scholars said there's no limit there's no limit pay attention to this 
Because we, if we follow this opinion, it's a very strong opinion, then we waste the opportunity for reward time and time again, year in and year out. They said there's no time. There's no time limit for the less. Meaning that you could go in for Salat al-Tarawih and you make the niyyah when you go into the masjid, Oh Allah, I'm entering into Atikaf until the end of Tarawih. And you get the ajr, alhamdulillah, of Atikaf. And obviously the other view that it's going to be at least one complete night or one complete day, then also, why not let's make the Atikaf just during the night. If we're busy during the day, we have to work, we have to take care of our families, and we can't stay in the masjid for 10 days. Why not just focus on the night? Alhamdulillah, your, main, your meals are there in the masjid, the suhoor, the iftar. You go and you break your iftar and you come back to your house after Salat al-Fajr or after Shuruq and you continue your day in Shalom Ta'ala. So if you can't do all of it, you can do some of it and that's for the blessings, the rahmah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, also from the things that we need to focus on in Atikaf is you know, the things, the, the actions. What do we need to be focused on? We mentioned the same actions we talked about and <coughs> the deeds we talked about during Layl al-Qadr. They're the same things that we need to be focusing on during Atikaf. But the beautiful thing about Atikaf is that actually we're training ourselves to do uh, certain acts of worship even more so. Because when you're in the masjid, for example, let's say we're in the masjid for Salat al-Fajr now, in Atikaf. The Adhan is being called. You have the opportunity now to repeat the Adhan after the Mu'adhan. And you're getting the same reward as the Mu'adhan is getting as Rasulullah sallallahu said in the Hadith. And then you get the opportunity to sit on the Saf al awwal the first line, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're in Salat. As the Prophet said in the other hadith, you're getting, it's written down for you like you're praying. You're in the Salat because you're just waiting for the Salat. So you're sitting there waiting for the Salat. You're on the front row. And during that time, between the Adhan and between the Iqamah, the Dua is mustajab. The Dua is answered. It's accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here's another opportunity. So when you're in your Atikab, you can take all of the things we mentioned that you need to be focusing on during the last 10 days and much, much more, taking things to the top, going higher and higher, benefiting more and more, strengthening your iman, getting more and more reward. And that's why the ones who have the ability to do so, they should focus on making atikaf for the last 10 days or as many days or as many hours as they can for the last 10 days, inshallah ta'ala. Like, two more things we'll mention when we wrap up the atikaf, and those are the things that are allowed during the itikaf and the things that are not. What's permissible and what's not during these last 10 days? What is permissible is to exit the masjid for something that is necessity. Pay attention to that. If it's necessity, you have to leave the masjid for it, you're allowed to leave the masjid. Like, for example, to make wudu. Or if you're in a masjid where nobody's bringing the food and, 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 and water and what have you to the people, then you're allowed to go out and buy your food. You're allowed to go out to a, a restaurant close by. Pay attention close by. You're not going to travel. Uh, extensive travel because it's a restaurant you like, but you're going to go uh, somewhere close by, get your food, and you know, preferably bring it back uh, or eat it very quick there, five, ten minutes, and come back, and you go back to the masjid. So you're, you're allowed to do that. Also, you can talk with the people. Just because you're in isolation doesn't mean you can't talk. But you can need to only be talking in that which is beneficial for you and your, and your, and your, 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 your deen, and that which is strengthening your iman and bringing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to refrain while we're making itikaf of talking about the things that do not benefit us. Uh, even sometimes if we have to go to take a shower, if there's no shower there, we can go out, take a shower, and come back to the masjid. And uh, even if your family comes to visit you in the masjid, if you're making itikaf, it's permissible you for you to spend an hour or so with them, talking to them, because sometimes it's difficult for the family to be away from their spouse, or even the sister, she's the one making itikaf, the brother, he comes and he visits her and spends like an hour with her. And this has been confirmed that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do this with his wife as it came in the hadith of Safiya that she came to him and he was making itikaf and he stayed with her and talked to her for some time and then he took her to the door and walked her around the way to her house uh, so this is permissible like the things <coughs> which nullify our itikaf is leaving the masjid on purpose for something that which is not necessity or for a long extended period of time all of these things nullify the itikaf, and the things that notify the itikaf as well is any sexual relations one might have, whether it be any, uh, if you were to leave itikaf for that, and obviously it's something that shouldn't be happening in the masjid, but sometimes it was on a house next to the masjid or something like that, where that could be possible, 
this also would nullify the itikaf. And obviously for the sisters, if her minces were to start during that time, also this nullifies the itikaf. So these are the main things that we need to know and focus on. And obviously the sunnah we said is to enter on the night uh, of, the two, of, the, of the 21st in the morning time. I mean, it will be the, the 20th uh, to enter the, in the morning time to pray uh, is there, or to be there for these 10 days. And then we wouldn't leave the itikaf until the Mughrib when Ramadan is announced whether it be on the 29th, and obviously on the 30th, if we, if we fast it for 30 days, that at Mughal time, on that last day, we would exit our itikaf and return to our houses and return to everyday life. The last thing we're going to talk about, inshallah ta'ala, quickly before we open up the floor for the questions, inshallah ta'ala, is that of the zakat al fitr So a lot of times we get involved in the ibadah and we forget this ruling of zakat al fitr And here, once again, subhanAllah, we have... <coughs> Uh, another pillar of Islam which has come and he during Ramadan. And if you look at Ramadan, subhanAllah, Ramadan gathers all of the pillars of Islam more or less. Because if you look, for example, with Ramadan and fasting, you have the fasting first of all and foremost, then you have uh, the issue of the Tuhid, the Shahada, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because our fast and all of these acts of ibadah and worship, we do it only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, the testimony of faith, it comes into act. Also, we have the zakat, either zakat al fitr or sometimes even people who pay their zakat money during Ramadan. And also we have, as well, during this month, from the pillars of Islam, we also have, not the hajj, but we have umrah, which is the, the small version of the hajj, which we have during Ramadan as well, which is the um, to make umrah during Ramadan. So that also has a relationship with, with, with the siyam, and also we have, obviously, the Salat, focusing more and more so on increasing in the voluntary prayers. You see all the five pillars of Islam, they are combined and come together during the month of Ramadan to complete all of our acts of worship, alhamdulillah. Zakat al-Fitr. Why was it called Zakat al-Fitr? Because, obviously, we pray it, we, we pay it after we finish the fasting. It's called the Fitr. The time that we do, it's called the, 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 the time of fasting, we pay the zakat during that time. So this is why it's called zakat al-fitr, and also it has, because it has nothing to do with the zakat of money. So we're not confused between the two. So we're paying the zakat during this time, and that's why it's called zakat uh, al-fitr. And zakat al-fitr is compulsory. It's fard upon every Muslim to pay one sa'ah, as the Prophet mentioned in the hadith of tamar or uh, barley or what have you from whatever is available or the, uh, the which is the food of the scholars say the food of the people of the country the main food so if you look for example even though rice is not mentioned in the hadith if that was the main food of your country then that becomes what you can pay to the people so he mentions uh, the Sallallahu Alaihi several different things in the hadith but what's important is this sa'a and the sa'a what does the sa'a mean the sa'a is equivalent to about uh, two kilograms and about uh, 250 grams. So I mean, le less than two and a half kilograms. Some say two and a half, some say three. If you want to pay a little bit more, make it three just to make it better. That is permissible, it's possible, no problem. But about, you know, two and a quarter is the precise weight. And some scholars might say up to about two and a half kilograms of the food of the people of the country. So if, if your thing is flour where you're from, that would be what you would give for zakat and fitr. And it's compulsory upon, as the Prophet said in the hadith, every Muslim, whether kabir or sagheer, meaning whether he's old or young, dhakr or untha, whether he's male or female, or hur or abd, meaning if he's somebody who's free or somebody who's a slave, all of these people must pay the zakat. And even it's sunnah to pay the zakat if the sister is pregnant, the woman is pregnant, that she uh, has the baby, when they say that the one who's over four months, who... Uh, has the soul inside that they pay zakat on as well and this is something that Uthman radiallahu an used to do and the Sahaba and the scholars and the Muslims follow in his footsteps so it's sunnah to pay also for the, for the woman who is pregnant for the baby and her stomach as well inshallah ta'ala and it's wajib upon who to pay every person individually no it's wajib upon the head of the household the person who's responsible for taking care of the family he's the one who has to pay for the zakat so the man has to pay for his zakat, his wife's zakat, his children's zakat. If he's taking care of his mother and father and, and throughout the year, he has to pay their zakat as well. 
this is the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is what is fard upon us and we must do uh, pay the zakat like this for everybody who we are responsible for. And there's a condition which is put for zakat and that is that we have the what we need, our basic needs from our food and our other basic needs for that day. If we have that for that day, then we must pay the zakat. But if we're too poor, we don't need to have our basic needs, then we don't have to pay zakat the fitr. But most people have their basic needs and a little bit more. Therefore, almost everybody will be paying the zakat along with best. What is the hikmah, the wisdom behind this zakat being made at this time? Uh, it came in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of the wisdoms behind this fast, or this, this zakat, that it's uh, is purifying for the one who is fasting. And it makes up for any of the shortcomings he had, uh, or he might have done during this time. And it is something to give to the masakeen, to the poor. And it came another hadith to make them not have to ask and beg during this time. Because they have that which needs from the food for that day. So they don't have to come, and they don't have to beg for people during that day. So this is some of the wisdoms why we pay this zakat. Also, or the last issue that we need to talk about, or there's two more issues, which is, how much do we need to pay, and do we pay it by food or by money? And the last issue is the time that we need to pay it. The first issue is how do we pay zakat al-fitr? Because obviously we see from the hadith that, that Rasulullah made it fard, and he mentioned different types of, 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 uh, of food, like the dates and the barley and what have you. So. We learn from this hadith that we must pay it in as food. But what about paying it as money, equivalent? Because some scholars say, especially some contemporary scholars in our day, they say it's enough to pay in money, where you can go and you can see about two and a half kilos or two and a quarter kilos. How much is that equivalent to in rice in my country? How much is that equivalent to in flour or barley in my country? And I go and I give that as cash instead. Is this permissible? Is it accepted? The majority of the scholars say this is not acceptable and you cannot give zakat al fitr as money. Pay attention to that. The majority of the scholars from the Maliki and Shafi and Hanbali Madhabs, all of them say that you cannot give zakat al fitr as money and it must be given in the form of. Food, as the Prophet ﷺ said, the food of the people of the country. And this is because, obviously, clearly that the Prophet ﷺ commanded this, and he only commanded them to give food, and he only gave food, and the Sahab and all those who followed in their footsteps, that's all that they did as well. It was never known that they were giving uh, forms of money instead of food. Also, um, what's meant is, is that this type of zakat is different from the zakat of money. The zakat of money has its place in Sharia. This is a different type of zakat. And this goes back to this kind of the food, where you must give it food. And this is the strongest opinion of all of the scholars. The second opinion is the opinion of the Hanafi scholars and those who took their opinion from the contemporary scholars today, is that it is permissible to give it in money. Uh, and they say, because what's meant by the zakat is to help out the poor person. And whether you give them food or you give them money, you're helping them out. And that does have uh, a good point of view. It does make sense. However, the fact that the process has made it farther from food and only gave us food shows you the first opinion is stronger. Furthermore, we learn from experience and pay attention to this, is that a lot of times, a lot of the poor people, they don't have money. And when they get money, sometimes they waste it because they don't know what to do with it. So they haven't had a lot of money, so you give them money and they go out and they buy, for example, I see this with my own eyes, they'll go out and they'll buy like, you know, some ice cream for their kids, which is nice because they want their kids to have fun. But what would have been more beneficial than that ice cream? If I would have had enough rice, enough flour to last me for four months, six months, and this has happened. I know some poor people who told us from the zakat al fitr they get, they have enough to eat off for one entire year. Lord, how about that? But so many people come and give us rice so we can eat for the entire year. Alhamdulillah. We don't need it. We just add on a few small things here and there. They said it makes it very easy for us to survive throughout the year because of uh, this zakat al fitr. So, it's not necessarily better than money. It could actually be more harmful to them because they might go and waste it really quick and not benefit from it. And something that is in bulk like that, from flour or, or barley or, or rice or, or dates or what have you, it's going to be more beneficial for them throughout the year. And Allah knows best. There's 
<coughs> another opinion that some of the scholars mention, uh, and that is Sheikh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, and it's opinion also uh, in, in the Hanbali Madhab, that you have to look in this situation to see it's permissible to give it in cash if there is a need to do so. If there's a need to do so, and obviously uh, the need could be a difficulty or the fact that the people actually do really, really need money. So they said in this situation you could give it in the form of money, but the original would be that you must give it in food and Allah knows best. But the best opinion is that you give it in food if possible in general time. And the question comes here a lot, uh, what if I don't know the poor people, what if it's difficult? Alhamdulillah, there's a lot of agencies that can help you in getting that food to the poor people. So that's what you should focus on doing, inshallah ta'ala. And the last thing we'll mention as we wrap up, inshallah ta'ala, <coughs> is the time that we must pay, uh, pay the zakat. When do we have to pay the zakat, the zakat al-fitr? There's two times that we can pay the zakat al-fitr. The time that is the best time and the time that is the permissible time. The time that is the best time and the time that is the permissible time. So the time which is uh, the best time is what came in the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is after Salatul Fajr on the day of Eid up until the time of Eid. From the time of Fajr on the day of Eid up until the Eid prayers. And it must be given before the Eid prayers. If it's given after the Eid prayers, it's not accepted. As the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith that it must be given before the Eid prayers, Whoever gives it after the Eid prayers, it will be counted as a form of sadaqah. Only as a form of sadaqah, and will not be accepted as a zakat al-fitr, and he will be sinful, have committed a sin for delaying it. So this is the best time. However, it's a bit dangerous sometimes because it's a very tight time. It can only be an hour and a half or two hours. Uh, so you have a very limited time, and you might not be able to do it. So there's another time, which is the permissible time, and that is a day or two, and some say even more, you know, three or four days more. But... Uh, as it was confirmed, Ibn Umar radiallahu an and other Sahaba, they would give it a day or two before. That's just in case, so that's permissible to give it, like on the 28th, 29th of Ramadan, uh, you start to give you a zakat al fitr that is permissible. We have to be careful, obviously not to delay it so we don't fall into sin. And that brings us to an end of the main things we want to mention. And as we mentioned in today's uh, webinar, we focused not just on the title about how to maximize our ibadah, that was the key focus, but we also focus on some other issues that we need, some fiqh issues when it comes to itikab, zakat al fitr uh, and other issues as well that we need to focus on, because one of the keys also to maximizing and benefiting and having a fruitful time during these last 10 days is to understand the different ahkam, the different rulings as well, so that's why we want to mention these, so we could be on ilm, on basira, because we, we have, when you're on knowledge of your deen, alhamdulillah, it takes everything to another level, alhamdulillah. May Allah knows best. Allah alam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Wa baraka ala nabiya Muhammad. Let's start the questions. Jazakallahu khairan for this amazing uh, motivation to really enhance all of our good deeds in the in the final part of Ramadan and especially in the last ten days. I know that we are all very anxious to seek Laylatul Qadr now and to make it to Kaf in the Masjid, and we will do, be doing that with sound knowledge. Alhamdulillah, and may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless you for for sharing that knowledge with us today. So now to begin uh, our question and answer session, I first just wanted to give everybody that's not an Islamic Online University student just a, a, a brief statement about IOU first and then we'll go to the questions and answers. The Islamic Online University is the brainchild of Dr. Bilal Phillips. He envisioned an institution that would offer online intensive undergraduate and graduate courses completely tuition free. The IOU introduced the world's first tuition-free online Bachelor of Arts in Islamic Studies based on modified curriculum derived from those of the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia, Umm Duraman Islamic University in Sudan, Al-Azhar from Egypt. This path-breaking initiative utilizes the worldwide presence of the Internet and advanced open-source online learning technology to bring low-cost university level education within the reach of anyone on the planet who has access to a computer and the internet. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen and today the IOU offers diverse degrees and diplomas ranging from Islamic studies to psychology to education. So we have two separate virtual campuses, one for the degree campus and one for our free diploma courses. Please check them out on our website. 
Now for the first question. Indira Umu Nehra. What is the difference between Takdir Allah, who has written 50,000 years before the creation of the skies and earth, and Takdir on Laylatul Qadr, written for every human for the upcoming one year? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Hopefully I'll be able to go a little bit slower because I know sometimes we say I talk too fast, but we had a lot to cover, so I was kind of going a bit quick. So hopefully we will slow down and hopefully it was understandable to everybody. Uh, inshallah ta'ala. Um, the question is a very good question. and It's a question that pops into a lot of people's minds. And what is the difference? Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created things and he, before he created the heavens and earth and he, uh, that he, he put everything that was going to happen and the Loh al-Mahfud is written down in Loh al-Mahfud until Yom al-Qiyamah. Everything in the Qadr has already been decreed. So how can we understand that and this taqdeer, the Qadr that is going to be in Laylatul Qadr, what's going to happen for the next year, as it's been confirmed from the ayah and from uh, the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa What is the meaning of this? And the meaning of this is that what happens during this one year, during Laylatul Qadr, is that this taqdeer is the duties given to the angels, the specific angels, the ones who are protecting you, the ones who are in charge of, of doing other duties, and things like that. This is what's going to happen. And the ones who are writing the things down, and all of this. All of these, these duties that are sent out to the angels, it's not sent out to them what's going to happen from the beginning of time. It's sent out to the angels what's going to happen during that year, during this night. So that's the difference. So you have the thing that has been decreed before Allah created the heavens and earth. It's in the Loh al-Mahfud. Everything that will happen from then until Yom al-Qiyamah. That's it. That's the main thing when it comes to the Qadr. But the other taqdeer which the sister is asking about, this is the duties of the angels and what they will be doing, fulfilling throughout the year, and Allah knows best. Jazakallahu Karen Sheikh. So, for example, if a sister is facing talaq, um, her husband has mentioned that he has the intention to you know, make talaq in the month of Ramadan, but he's going to postpone the actual pronouncement till after the Eid, out of courtesy of the Holy Month, for example. Would there be any benefit for her to make a lot of du'a on Laylatul Qadr and in the last 10 days of Ramadan and at the accepted times of invocation? I mean, would that have any impact on the Qadr? I'm just trying to give a you know practical example that maybe the people might understand this better. Yes, it's, a, it's a good question. And actually, the uh, it has been confirmed in the Sunnah of Rasulullah that one of the things that you know uh, could actually have an impact on changing the Qadr is the du'a itself. But and obviously, and when it comes to a situation like you mentioned, we don't know the true outcome. So it's upon us to make du'a to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, who's the controller of the hearts. Because here, he hasn't pronounced the talaq. He has the intention. He wants to do it. But as long as he hasn't done it, then the talaq itself won't happen. So if the, the du'a is made and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accepts it, then that was a, a change of the qadr they thought was going to happen. But it ends up being something else that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala had planned, which is for them not to get divorced. And Allah knows best. So making du'a, obviously, and he, even now, and he, you, you could find yourself, for example, something, it is, we don't know what the outcome of the Qadr is. Allah knows only. So that any anything that happens to us in life, we're supposed to, to strive to make dua. You could, for example, be put in prison, and you you have certainty that, unless you're going to do 25 to life. You're caught red-handed, you did this, but you make tawbah, and you start to repent to it, you start to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something happens, and you get off, and you get free. You never know. So you always, and sometimes we, we get down, like, oh, it's over. No, we continue. Because we don't know the outcome, we continue to make dua, and perhaps the outcome will be something that's pleasing to us in Allah knows best. And if we don't get it, something pleasing in this dunya from the dua, and so we'll get it in the hereafter, inshallah ta'ala. Or be spared from a calamity or something like that, yeah. right, Shaykh? All, now, all of these three that was confirmed in the Sunnah of Rasulullah says, you, you, you will get what you asked, or you'll be spared from a calamity in this dunya, or you'll get better than that yawm al-qiyam. One of these three things, as it was confirmed in the Sunnah of Rasulullah, so something we'll get for making the du'a. So the du'a, as we say, alhamdulillah, it's a win-win situation, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Question number two, a sister from Toronto, Canada is asking, how do I maximize my ibadah as a mother of four children, ages one, three, six, and eight, who are alone with me 24 hours a day? SubhanAllah, she's a very bu busy lady. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make everything easy for you. And accept all your it reminds service. me of my wife, the same way. <laughs> SubhanAllah. 
for all of them, for all of the mothers of our Uma. Uh, my, uh, my husband works 16 to 18 hours a day, and I am the sole caregiver on the weekends. He cannot reduce his hours due to our circumstances financially. Their, need, their needs are endless and round the clock. Basically, they don't sleep through the night yet, leaving me almost no time for my personal Ibada, and this makes me feel extremely distraught, empty, and exhausted. I desperately need help so I don't lose out again this year. So what can you advise her, Sheikh? Uh, this is a, is a very common question that happens, and you know, no doubt it's difficult for her and for many of the mothers, especially when you have children of that age, one in three, who are very demanding and need a lot of attention. But the mistake comes from our sisters is that they tend to forget is that what they're doing in itself is ibadah. It's great ibadah. Being a mother and raising these children in itself is a great form of ibadah. And I recall that Sheikh Ali Muthaymin mentioned you know, encouraging the sisters. Because a lot of them call and they said, we're so busy, especially you know, in a lot of countries where they have certain customs and you know, certain and things they eat during Ramadan that are special only for Ramadan. So you'll find the poor uh, sister, she's in, in the kitchen for long hours during the day. Then at nighttime she's tired. And the chef told her, he said that, you know, don't forget this in itself. For you to uh, serve these people and to give them their iftar and to give them this food, it's also ibadah. All you have to do is change your intention. And Allah knows, and that's one of the points we mentioned about benefiting, is to do what you can. Even if it's a small amount, Allah knows your intention, that you want to do more, but you can't. And he, I, I see my wife now, and he, sometimes she wants to cry because she can't make tarawih, because my son is too demanding. But that's, that's the way it is. That's, just, that's how it is. But when she makes the intention now that, alhamdulillah, me taking care of my children, raising my children, this in itself is ibadah. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this in the hadith. He said, even the food that you put into the wife of your mouth, it's a form of sadaqah. It has to have the correct niya. You have to have the correct niya. So alhamdulillah, say, Ya Allah, I wish I could do more. And you know my intention, Ya Allah. But I'm focusing on my children because this in itself is ibadah. So alhamdulillah, raising the children during the nights will be ibadah, inshallah ta'ala. And then, with the free time you have, <coughs> do what you can do. Listen to the Quran. Have the Quran playing in the house. Have maybe the Quran on your headphones, on, on, your, on your mobile telephone. Um, you can, uh, you know... Uh, maybe listen to the Quran while you're laying with the kids as you're putting them to sleep or something like that. You can make the dua, Allahumma innaka afu wa tuhibu al-afa fa'afu anni. You can also make the dua uh, <coughs> for istighfar, making dhikr throughout the night. There's so many things you can do in your free time, but you just have to focus. I know it's difficult, I know it's tiring, but you just do what you can do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, He knows your niyyah. And don't forget that you are in ibadah with what you're doing, raising your children anyways, alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy on all mothers in this holy month to reap the reward and benefits through their niya and, and service to their husbands and families. The third question is from Noor uh, and Sakina from Spain, Jamila from Nigeria, and some sisters from the Maldives, UK, and US. How can a sister make the most of the 10 days of Ramadan in the days of menstruation? Also, what should a woman do on the other nights when she can't make tarawih outside of the last ten nights of Ramadan? I do obviously still have it. Uh, this is something, it's actually easier than what you think because the sister can do everything that she can do when she's in a normal state without her menses except for the prayer. The only thing that she can't do is pray. Pay attention to this. This is something a misconception. For example, reading the Quran. Many people think that the sister cannot read the Quran. That's a very weak opinion that the scholars mention. Even though a lot of scholars mention it, it's actually very weak and has no evidence upon it. The only one who can't read the Quran is the one who's in the state of Janaba, the one who has to make a major ghusl from being with their spouse. But when it comes to the woman who's on her menses for seven days, for eight days, for ten days, depending, uh, six days, how many days she has it, then it's not something logical that she would refrain from reading the Quran any time throughout the year, not just in Ramadan. So she's allowed to read the Quran, no problem whatsoever. Okay, This is the correct opinion. She can read the Quran. However, when it comes to touching the Quran, this becomes more of an ikhtilaf, of a difference of opinion with the scholars. Can she touch the Quran or not? So we say, out of respect for this ikhtilaf, there's other things she can do. She can take the iPad, or she can take her telephone and read the Quran from that. That doesn't take the same ruling as the Quran. Or, as some scholars said, out of respect to put gloves on. <coughs> to put gloves on and to read the Quran like that. So any of these things she can do and she can read the Quran. She makes the same dhikr that we make. 
She makes the same dua that we make. All the things that everybody else is doing, she can do, alhamdulillah, except for the salat. So she focuses on what she has in front of her. And like we said, focus on where you're strong and what gives you inspiration from the, the options that you have. And Allah knows best. Jazakallah khairan. And we have question number four from Sharon Ali. I have a question regarding the Tarawih Salah. What is best, to pray it individually in the last quarter of the knot or praying it with the congregation straight after the Isha? I would advise during the last 10 days to do both of them. I would advise during the last 10 days to do both of them. First of all, because if you pay in the congregation, you get great reward. We all know that. <coughs> also, you get the reward of having prayed the entire night. And I was mentioning something before, and I just, it dawned on me that I forgot to mention the second way we can have uh, the, the, the entire night prayer uh, or written for us like we were praying in, during the entire night. I mentioned there's two ways, but during the, uh, the lecture I forgot to mention the second one, and that is the hadith of Rasulullah when he said that if you pray Isha in the congregation, it's written for you half, uh, like you prayed half of the night. Pay attention. You pray Isha in congregation in the masjid, it's written for you like you prayed for half the night, like you've been praying night prayer for half the night. And then if you pray Fajr in the masjid, it's written for you as if you have been prayed the entire night in prayer. So if you pray these two prayers in the masjid, and he, what is in between all of the night, it's written for you, the ajr, like you're standing in prayer, alhamdulillah. It's from the Sunnah of Rasulullah So this is even more so we should focus. We focus on all, all through the year, but more so obviously during the month of Ramadan, the last 10 days. So it's like we're written, like we're praying. Uh, during the, this time, inshallah ta'ala. So it's, I, I always recommend that she should pray both of them. She prays with the congregation, and then you get the reward. If you pray with the imam until the end, like if you pray for the entire night. And then if you want to go back to the masjid and pray more, if they have another uh, qiyam, you can pray with them, or you can pray at home, uh, just general nafil during the night, and all is, all is best. But I would say in general, if you want any, one or the other, that you see which one you find more tranquility with. Where do you find your heart? This is the key thing. We mentioned this. Where do you find your heart? If you find your heart more at home, and you find more tranquility, and you're crying more in the salat, and you're benefiting more from the salat, then it's better for you that you pray at home. If you find you're lazy at home, and you find more tranquility in the masjid, then it's better you pray in the masjid, and Allah knows best. That's in general. If you don't combine between the both. SubhanAllah. So, so Shaykh, obviously, for those people that do make their intention to make it to calf and actually go do it, they're going to be able to easily access all of this reward and that's what that's one of the reasons why we're encouraged to make it the gap because our nature as human beings is that we're a bit lazy, we're a bit weak, you know. So what happens is when you when you're in that environment, you're encouraged and you know and you're inspired. So that's why we, if you can make it the gap, all of us we should during these last ten days. I even encourage the brothers a lot of times to take from their vacation during these last ten days to make this you know part of your, your yearly vacation so you can just focus on doing ibadah if possible, inshallah during these last ten days. Subhanallah. We have question number five from Widad Mugni from Australia. Can we give zakat al fitr on behalf of someone who has passed away, or is this only counted as sadiqa jariya? Is there a du'a that we can make or ways to keep our iman high after the last ten nuts uh, of Ramadan has passed and Ramadan has concluded? Okay, um, the first question she's asking is two and one. Is zakat al fitr given on someone who's passed away? No, that wouldn't be correct. It's only on the people, obviously, who are alive. But if you were to give, it wouldn't be considered sadaqa jariya because you know you shouldn't be giving zakat al fitr. But you can give sadaqa on behalf of the person who has died, but not in the form of zakat al fitr. So if you want to give sadaqa jariya or sadaqa in general on the person who is uh, who has passed away, the deceased, then you give just general sadaqa and not zakat al fitr. Uh, the second question is: Is there a dua we can make? And the general du'as the Prophet Sallallahu used to make all the time to have strong iman and to keep his heart firm upon the religion, which is Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thab al-qalbi ala deenik. Oh Allah, the control of the heart, keep my heart uh, firm. And also, uh, you know, Rabbana la tazil qulubana ba'da hadaytana the du'a from the Qur'an, from Surah Ali Imran, and asking Allah not to make our hearts go astray after we've been guided. And generally you can ask, and even if it's just you put it into your own wording, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep your iman uh, strong after the month of Ramadan and to let you continue during the month of Ramadan. But as we know, that from the belief of the Muslims is that the iman increases and decreases. And what we need to remind ourselves of is that why our iman reaches a high level in Ramadan 
and why it goes down after Ramadan. It's because during Ramadan, look at our actions. Look how we're striving to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fasting, praying, staying away from ill speech, staying away from haram things, uh, going to the masjid, uh, mixing and mingling with our brothers in ways that are good and beneficial. Uh, we're, we're coming together for iftar, we're, co we're inviting one another over for dinner, we're coming together for tahajjud, we're coming together for qiyam. Not like outside of Ramadan, we're coming together, we're making qiba, we're making namima, and we're corrupting our hearts. So this same thing, we need to be continuing even after Ramadan. If we continue to do these good deeds, our iman will continue to increase. We're going to have ups and downs all the time, alhamdulillah, but you're going to find yourself more on a high level of iman and continue up even throughout Ramadan if you continue doing the same deeds and actions that you were doing in Ramadan and Allah knows best. <coughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all steadfastness in Ramadan and after as well. Right. Question number six uh, we have coming from Malaysia. My father-in-law passed away on January 1st, 2015 leaving behind his wife and six children. Five of his children are married. Right now, my mother-in-law and her youngest daughter are living with me and my wife. So my question is, who has to pay the zakat tel fitr for my mother-in-law and my youngest sister-in-law who are living with me? Is it myself or her eldest son or any of her other children? Uh. First of all, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon your father-in-law and grant him Jannah Rabbil Alameen. Uh, regarding the question, it's not responsible upon you to pay that zakat. And he, may Allah bless you for taking care of them now and having them in your house. And that is a great form of sadaqah and a great ajr, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah reward, reward you abundantly. When it comes to zakat al fitr or something that's fart, uh, that's not fart upon you. It's fart upon uh, her children, her sons, to pay it upon her. The eldest son, or if there's another one who is more better off than, than him, that he pays it also for his mother and for his sister and the law knows best. Okay, we have question number seven coming from Abu Bakr and Zainab Suleiman. I am a working mother. I cook for my family. I hope, I hope, and I hope, I hope Abu Bakr is not a working mother. You know, actually, I've, yes, I I've, maybe this is, her, this is her last name with a, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe in a different Zainab form. The, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I say, so basically, I think we're referring to Zainab here, um, yeah. and Zainab is a working mother, and she cooks for her family uh, and also the mosque close by for Iftar. At the end of the day, I barely have time to read Quran. Can you kindly guide or assist me? So yet another question about troubled sisters over their lack of time to do ibadah. It's basically the same question we answered in, in the, was it, I believe, the second question. Uh, first of all, don't forget, sister, that this is a great ajr. Because, subhanAllah, when you come Yom Al-Qiyamah, you're not just going to have the ajr of taking care of your family, you're going to have the ajr also of having the ajr of everyone who fasted through your family. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Man that whoever helps somebody, a fasting person, break his fast, he gets the reward of that person fasting as well. Obviously, his reward stays the same, but you'll get a reward. So it's going to be like your fast and three or four or five, six other fasts from your family. And if you're feeding the entire masjid, Allahu Akbar, that might be 100 people, 200 people, 50 people, whatever it is. Also, you're getting the ajr for all of those. So alhamdulillah, even though you're very tired, you're not reading much Quran, you're getting so much, so much reward for this. It's a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same advice we gave to the sister earlier, that with whatever strength that you have, whatever time you have, do what you can do. Be in the kitchen listening to the Quran. Alhamdulillah, Allah has made it so easy for us. It's a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can have we have our on our telephones, on our apps, on the computer. You go to TV Quran uh, dot com, for example, and you just listen to the Quran or any other of the of the good websites they have, and you just listen to the Quran. You go on YouTube, you put on your favorite Qari and he and he and you you have your computer when you're in or your iPad or whatever and you're in the kitchen listening. Alhamdulillah, so there's so much opportunity. And he, maybe it's not exactly what we want it, but there's other alternatives. So you try as hard as you can, and Allah knows your intention. Allah knows you want to read Quran more. And because of that intention, that if I had the strength, if I had the ability, oh Allah, I would read more, I would do more. Allah, inshallah ta'ala, will give you the ajr for that, for your niyyah, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so don't be, uh, don't be sad and don't be worried, alhamdulillah, because you have a lot of good. And just continue and do what you can do with the strength and the free time you have, and Allah knows best. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question on this. Let's say, for example, a sister doesn't have children yet, and every single Ramadan she really seized it to the greatest extent, you know, making so many, uh, you know, additional uh, prayers and 
praying Tarawee every night in the masjid. Even maybe she made it to calf the last 10 days. So, but then all of a sudden she does get pregnant and or she has a small child and she can no longer do all of those different types of ibadah. She just has to stay home. Would she get rewarded as though she did it because she was so consistent in that in previous years? Uh, inshallah, she would. Because the hadith of the Prophet Sallam, where he mentioned that the one who has traveled or the one who was sick, uh, that he will get the same reward written for him that that which he used to do when he was a resident or when he was healthy. So similar to that now, if the sister were to do that and then she was striving and she and she has the, the, the knee and her heart is, is burning inside and she wants to be able to make atikaf again. She wants to be able to, to do what she used to do before. And she and she says, hey Allah, if I get the opportunity, again, if my children get, get older, then I will do this and this and this. Allah knows the niyyah. And subhanahu so from the beauty of Islam is that Allah rewards us, inshallah ta'ala, according to that niyyah. So inshallah, if that's the case, inshallah, we ask Allah that she will get the reward for that, and Allah knows best. Okay, so sisters that don't have any children yet, you better seize the moment so that you can get the reward later, inshallah, too, while you're <laughs> not able to do it any longer. Okay, so we have a question from Abdullahi from uh, Nigeria. During the last 10 days, I simply can't attend Qiyam Alel in congregation, so can I do mine at home, and can I just pray to Rakat, concentrating more on the recitation of the Noble Qur'an? Um, yes, that's very simple. Allah does not and he hold us to do more than that we can do it. So if that's all you can do, Allah knows your intention. Allah knows what you can do. And then at the at the end, like the brothers mentioned, sometimes if you focus just on quality, and it, it could be better sometimes in the quantity that it's not really there. Sometimes people are just moving and not paying attention, but somebody's really focusing on doing something small, and and putting the effort into doing something precise but good, and perfecting that. Then perhaps inshallah ta'ala he will get uh, just as much reward inshallah. When it comes to the two rakats. Uh, don't just pray two rakats. You should pray two rakats and then one rakat of witr as well. Uh, and when it comes to the witr, you could pray one rakat. But obviously, the more you pray is better. The Sulullah says, I used to pray 11 rakats. But if you want to pray three, if you want to pray five, if you want to pray seven, that's all you have time to pray. All you have the ability to pray. Perhaps you work at night shifts. Uh, you know, people have different schedules. So, like we said, just do as much as you can and have the pure niya. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you great reward for that, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, question number nine is coming from a sister from Sri Lanka and also another one from Jeddah. Actually, sisters, um, we will not answer this question. It's about women making it to calf and um, other issues that have already been covered. So we're going to go to question number 10 from Lukman from Gambia. It is said that when a person is too weak or ill to fast during the holy month of Ramadan, he should instead give out hands handful of of grains as a daily charity to the poor till the end of Ramadan. I think he's referring to Fidia. What, um, what is the exact clarification to someone who is very old in age and also ill that he cannot keep fast but cannot afford to give out this daily charity due to poverty? My father who is uh, very old, 75 years of old, suffering from a stroke, cannot fast now but we are very poor and cannot afford to pay this daily uh, charity or fidya during the month of Ramadan, is there any punishment? Is it possible to give out little money as a substitute for the grains or is it possible to give this charity when I'm blessed with the opportunity after Ramadan? Okay, um, first of all, when it comes to the handful of grains, it's actually described as a half of a saw, and the process I'm described, and that's about equivalent to about a kilo and a quarter, so about a kilo and, a, and 125 grams, or a kilo and 250 grams, like that, in, in, in that in that area, is how much it's equivalent to. That is the half of the saw. That's how much a, a, a food they, they must give for the person who can't fast. The person who doesn't have the ability to fast due to old age or due to sickness. They have the opportunity or the ability to pay this fidya uh, instead or uh, instead of instead of fasting. I mean, that's no problem with that. But here the question is, the person has doesn't have the money, doesn't have the ability. So here, there's two scenarios. If he said it, you might have money after Ramadan, then you can pay it like in installments. Whenever you have a little bit of money, you pay a day here, pay a day there. Each week, for example, let's say if you get paid weekly or bi-weekly that you pay, for example, uh, if you get paid bi-weekly every two weeks that you feed two poor people each, each uh, two weeks, 
four people a month, uh, five people here, uh, maybe five people a month, something like that, until you ended up uh, finishing all 30, all 29, that is permissible, no problem. At the end of the day, if somebody is too poor and just cannot afford it, then alhamdulillah, he doesn't have to fast and he doesn't have to pay the fidya because he can't afford it, so he wouldn't be paying it during that time. But if you have the ability throughout the year, by paying, like I said, in installments, even if it's slowly, this becomes compulsory upon you to do that. And it's not a must that you pay it all off in Ramadan now, and Allah knows best. SubhanAllah, how merciful and flexible Islam is. Question number 11 is coming from Muhammad uh, Khalid in India. What what acts of worship are preferred on the knot of Al-Qadr? Should I try for the odd knots in my area, or the odd knots of Mecca, or all ten of the last knots in Ramadan? Please provide the appropriate hadith. Obviously, the acts of worship that are preferred, we went in that in, in detail, so no need to mention that again. Yeah. But when it comes to the issue that you have, obviously, we're supposed to focus more on the odd nights. But your situation is a bit of a problem and a bit unique because you don't know what the odd nights are. Is it the odd nights which are in Mecca? And I, I preferably prefer to follow the odd nights of, of, of Saudi Arabia because we know that they are somebody who are very, very professional when it comes to the sighting of the moon. And they have... Um, committees who go out with huge telescopes in areas where there's no lights and whatever and they're just focusing on that. So we know they're very trustworthy when it comes to that. But nonetheless, you should be following the, the fatwa of your country that Ramadan, if you start it a day late, uh, no problem, inshallah ta'ala. So here you have to focus on all the nights. You, can't, you don't have the ability here to focus on uh, just the odd nights because perhaps it might be the odd nights of Mecca could be Nayat al-Qadr. So here you have to focus even stronger on all ten nights. And in general, we should be focusing on all 10 nights in general. But if the process, and if we become weak, we focus on the odd nights. But in your situation, you really don't have any odd nights because of the difference in the fasting. So you don't know which ones are the true odd nights. So it's better you focus in detail on all of the nights and along those best. Okay, we have um, a sister, Romana, from California asking about some issues of how to pray the tarawih at home. Uh, it seems that there are many masajid that are relaying the tarawih live in my time zone and I think she means on television so I have started listening to them and praying on my own with my own Nia just mouthing the words when I hear them on the computer I make my own Nia for every raka in every prayer sometimes I open a translation of the Quran and skim through it whilst I am hearing this uh, tarawih all the while mouthing the words in Arabic, but I find this difficult to do, so I just mouth the words and read the translation later. Is this permissible? Barring this, I would have to open a mushaf and read from it. I have very little Quran memorized. Okay, if she's referring to the fact that she actually prays with them, she's saying open the computer, so she's online, for example, from another time zone or local masjid, where they're praying and she's following from her house, this is not acceptable, and the, and the prayer will not be accepted. It will be nullified. Because you have to actually be, if you're going to follow an imam, you have to be, the, the lines actually have to be reaching to where you are. So you cannot pray from your house. And even now, some of the, some of the uh, may Allah guide them, some of the people in Mecca, uh, for these, these big, nice hotels, some of them pray in their own hotel rooms outside of the masjid, far from the masjid. And their prayer is not accepted either, even though they're close by. Because the lines actually have to be reaching to where they are, and they have to be able to see these lines and what have you. So this prayer will not be accepted. And it's not, it's, it's not permissible to pray like this. Uh, reading through the Qur'an, uh, as you're reading, you can read through the Qur'an, but obviously English trans the translation shouldn't be read during the Salat. It should only be in Arabic. You can read the English and the translation, as you mentioned, after the Salat. But if you want to pray by yourself without following from the, from the, from the, the computer or from the TV, or you just read from the Qur'an by yourself at home uh, in the Arabic, then that's no problem. And alhamdulillah, if you only have a little bit memorized, even if you just memorize, you read with just that little bit you have memorized every night, or if you can read the Quran in Arabic and you read it during, uh, from your tarawih through the from the mushaf itself, that's no problem. Uh, following a, a masjid uh, somewhere else on the TV or on the computer, that is not acceptable, and the, and the prayer will not be accepted. Allah knows best. Subhanallah. Um, our next question is from Salir from Nigeria that's, and Zainab. Point that we uh, point out sources to that. A lot of the times, sometimes we have good niyyah, but in, for, for anything to be accepted, you know, my niyyah is good. You know, I can say now I'm in Doha, I'm in Qatar, I want to get, you know, more ajr, I find more for sure, I find myself better, 
if I pray with Sheikh Sadis and Sheikh Shireen, for example, in Mecca. So I turn it on the, the TV, uh, or I turn on my computer, I don't have a TV. So I turn on my computer, and I'm watching them, and I'm praying with them. I say, I find tranquility, I find my prayer is better. So I, have, I do have a good niyyah, but also for this action to be accepted, it has to be in accordance to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In certain conditions that you are with the imam, and the, the lines are spread, as the scholars mentioned, that they, they, they reach you and that you can actually see these lines in front of you. So if that's not met, then the prayer is not going to be acceptable. So even though I have this fantastic niyyah and I feel I'm feeling good inside by doing it, it's not going to be accepted because it's not in accordance to the, to the sharia and the Lord knows Okay, thank you for that clarification. That's actually very important because I think this is probably, a re this may be a revert and this is a question I've heard many times before also about all of these issues of praying when you can't actually see the Imam or from long distances. So we really appreciate that. And the question from Nigeria and Zainab from Nigeria is, um, can I start itikaf on the 25th of Ramadan? Can I read some books apart from the Quran? What are the signs of the Nad of Al-Qadr? We already covered that. And how do I recognize Laylat al-Qadr? So basically, she wants to know if she can start it after the 25th of Ramadan. You've already clarified that. But can she read books apart from the Quran? What's your advice on that? Yes, you can start any, like we mentioned, you can do itikaf anytime, from the beginning, the end, in the middle. Uh, it doesn't matter. You can start anytime when you have the free time, you have the ability to start itikaf. Reading the books, yes, that's possible, and even sometimes recommended, because reading an Islamic book, we're talking about reading a book, obviously, of the Quran, we mean Islamic books. During that, we don't want to focus on uh, you know, self-improvement books or novels or something like that, even though maybe self-improvement books are beneficial, but not during the last 10 days of Ramadan. We're talking about, we're talking about Islamic books, we're talking about Sahih Bukhari, we're talking about a book in Aqidah, a book in Fiqh, a book in the Seerah. This is permissible to read, and it could even be recommended. Because some people find themselves, they might read a little Qur'an, but they don't have the ability to read for a very long time. But then they can open up a book of Sirah, for example, and they can read 30, 40 pages. So you're, becoming clo you're coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and coming closer to following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa through these learnings, and you're increasing in knowledge, and that's also a great form of ibadah. In fact, seeking knowledge is one of the best forms of ibadah. So even though we can say maybe reading the Qur'an is better, but if you find yourself that you read more in these Islamic books, then you combine between the two, that's great, fantastic, no problem whatsoever, inshallah. Okay, we have Ibrahim from Nigeria asking, during the last 10 days of Ramadan, what makes it so special from the previous days of Ramadan that all of our sins are forgiven? Well, we have, uh, Ibrahim, during Ramadan, we have several opportunities to have our sins forgiven. In fact, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in general, that Ramadan to Ramadan, uh, is, you know, is, is sent, uh, uh, but what's between them will be forgiven when we fast Ramadan and another Ramadan. But we have three hadith which show us how the sins can be forgiven during Ramadan itself, and that is, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, Man sama Ramadan imana wa ihtisaba wa ghufira lo ma taqadda min dhanbi. That whoever fast Ramadan through his iman and through his ihtisab, and we said the ihtisab is that he wants the work reward from Allah, that his past sins will be forgiven. Another hadith, the Prophet said, Man qama. Whoever prays, meaning the night prayer during the month of Ramadan, also through his iman and through his ihtisab, that he wants the reward, his past sins will be forgiven. And the, the last ten nights, there's another opportunity where the Prophet said, Man qama laylat al qadr. Whoever fast, uh, whoever, excuse me, is praying during the night of laylat al qadr, that his past sins will be forgiven. Uh, also through his iman and his ihtisab as well. The same hadith. Uh, so, the same meaning in the hadith. So here is. Uh, Three opportunities we have to have our sins forgiven all throughout Ramadan and then especially and exclusively during the last 10 days. And obviously in the last 10 days, if you're focusing on doing what you should be doing and following the footsteps of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you're making the dua that he taught Aisha to make Radiallahu and then you're feeling, as we said, you're going to be closer to Tawbah during this time and closer to having the, your, your Tawbah and your repentance accepted and Allah knows best. Okay, so we have question number 15 from Sheikh Hamid, and you're really going to like this. This is an interesting question. When did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba and the Salat, sleep during Ramadan, um, and especially in the last 10 days? Did they sleep the nights or stay awake all night? After Sahur, would they sleep immediately or stay, stay awake until the, the Shuruq? pray and then sleep, and what exactly did they do during their itikaf? Uh, what they did during their itikaf, we already mentioned uh, that in some detail. 
But the other question, which is important, is about the sleep. And we did point to that, but to answer again, we said that the scholars differ because the hadith said, Ahya layla, that he would stay awake during the night. So they understood from this that he would focus the entire night, not sleeping and just worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praying, making dua, remembering Allah, reading the Quran, his acts of worship, making istighfar. That's what he would be doing, alayhi salatu wasalam, also the sahaba, the salaf, who followed his footsteps to stay awake for the entire night. There's a hadith which said that the person never stayed awake for an entire night. So some of the scholars said that no, he must have slept some because of this hadith. Other scholars say no, they said that this means outside of Ramadan. So either or, as we said, whether he slept the entire night, uh, sorry, he didn't sleep the entire night, or he slept just a little bit, one of the two. So he, he was either awake for the entire night or most of the night, where he just slept for a very, very little bit. And sometimes, and people are different, by the way. Some people have that ability to get that little power nap in, you know what I'm saying? Like, for example, you, you've, been, you've been worshiping like four or five hours, and you, you, know, you put your alarm clock on just in case, and you, you, know, you go and get that power nap on the couch, what's better than that, or on the, on the, on the floor, not on your blanket, because then you sometimes go for a long sleep. And you just get that 30 minutes, and you get some energy, and you get up. That's, that's okay. It's fantastic that you can do that. Other people, if they go to sleep, they're not going to wake up, and I even for the whole. So you have to see who you are and what you can do. So this is it. it was either this or that, that he was either the entire night awake or the majority of the night with a very little bit that he slept. And whatever it may be, it shows us that we should be striving during the, these nights uh, to sleep as little as possible and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as we can. Did he sleep after shuruq? Uh, what's been confirmed or known from the sunnah of Rasulullah is that he never slept after fajr. He never slept after fajr. So that means obviously he would sleep uh, probably sometime during the day. And the Prophet ﷺ, obviously, his sleep, even outside of Ramadan, was very, very little. But you would understand for the Salaf and the, those who came after him, that perhaps that they would sleep, uh, obviously, during the day more than they would, or maybe after Dhor. And like I mentioned, even in the days we live in, something I've experienced myself and other people who, who actually go to work, that a lot of times when Fajr is a little bit early, uh, that you know, we have the, the, the two hours we get in before we go to work, two and a half hours sometimes uh, after Fajr, that it's, it's, it's enough, alhamdulillah, and we can go to work and work at a, at a high level, a lot of blessing in the work. And at the same time, uh, maybe when you come home, you catch another nap before uh, uh, before Asr, or even if it's after Asr, even though it's not recommended generally to sleep after Asr, but during Ramadan, during this time, if you want to sleep during that time, to have strength and ability during the, the night to sleep before Maghrib, uh, as I will be doing when I finish with you now, inshallah ta'ala, because I've been awake all day, uh, then that is permissible, inshallah, to do. And you will get rewarded for that in a local blessing and barakah in that inshallah ta'ala. SubhanAllah. Um, uh, Sh Shamira is from Malawi and she's saying that most of us believe Laylatul Qadr is best conducted in the masjid, uh, but most of us cannot go on the, 20, on the odd knots. I feel like my iman is low and I've tried in the past years to go, but I never succeeded. So my question is this, if I'm going to stay home and try to do some kind of ibadah all night long without sleeping, can I just turn on an Islamic channel and watch that? Would there be any reward in it for me? The key is in the last sentence of the question, an Islamic channel. We need to make sure if we're going to do that, that it's an Islamic channel for sure. And then shaitan doesn't trip us and he trick us to go to the other channels. Uh, if this, no doubt watching Islamic programs and, and, and lessons and listening to the Quran through an Islamic channel, alhamdulillah, no doubt there's ajr reward in that. It's beneficial. Once again, like I said, but then again, don't make this for nine, ten hours. Make this part of your program. Okay, if you find yourself weak, okay, let's say now you find yourself weak and lazy to read the Quran. You can open up the Quran now on your computer, on your iPad, or, or, on your tap, on your on your, your smartphone, and you you have the recite to read and you follow along. And you're getting reward. And you're looking in the Mus'haf. You're looking into your, your iPad. You're following along. You're getting reward for that. So this is an opportunity. At the same time, listening to the Quran. Uh, making these dhikrs. Okay, you, you watch the TV show, now there's commercials. Okay, are you getting uh, uh, a for watching the commercials in the middle? No. You put it on mute, and then you start to make dua. You start to make istighfar. You start to say, Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhibbul afu fa'afu anni. You're making the dua uh, that the Prophet prescribed uh, for Aisha radiallahu anha. So these type of things you need to try to mix. But don't make this your whole thing, but yes, if you do some of the nights and you're watching some beneficial Islamic programs, then inshallah that will be a reward for that inshallah ta'ala in Allah. 
Okay, so we have a question coming from Humaira in Pakistan, which we've already answered. That's question number 17. Uh, question number 18 is coming from Fauzia Hawk from London. Uh, she wants to know about are there any special prayers in the last 10 days of Ramadan, including uh, Salat and Tasbih? So maybe she's referring to Salat al Tasbih, which uh, is a prayer that some people do. And they also attempt to do that in congregation. So you might want to talk about the permissibility of it or its status in Islam. Yeah, the, 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 the Salat Tasbih is not correct in the, in the not in Ramadan and not out of Ramadan. So it's not something that you should be doing, something you must stay away from doing. It's obviously anything that's embedded in religion won't be accepted. But if you mean Tasbih, meaning like Vikr, any type of Vikr you should be making or any type of particular prayer you should be making, the only Dua or, or the dhikr that was prescribed that we know from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the one we mentioned time and time again that he taught Aisha radiallahu anha which is Allahumma innaka afoon tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anni Oh Allah that you are all forgiving you love to forgive so forgive me so we repeat this time and time again and then the salat if you're talking about the general prayer that's what you're alluding to the general prayer obviously we know that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would make the qiyam uh, the tahajjud, that he would make 11 rakats as he would throughout the year. Obviously, in, in, in Ramadan and in the last 10 days, try to make it a bit longer, making the sujood longer, making the ruku longer, uh, reflecting more on the ayat, reading at a nice slow pace, reflecting on, on, on the ayat. This is what we should be doing, inshallah, when it comes to the prayer. And a lot of masajid now, they pray uh, twice during the night. If you can do that, alhamdulillah. Or if you just pray once during the night, that's all good. Perhaps in London, where you are, it might be difficult to pray twice. I don't know what the massage would do there, but I know it's very difficult because we're in Ireland. and it's Even though some people do pray twice, it's only five or six hours during the night anyways. So uh, praying once is enough in front of and We focus on other acts of worship uh, throughout the night, and Allah knows best. Okay, question 20 we've also answered as well. Uh, question 21 is coming from Aisha in Canada. Do I have to pay zakat on used jewelry? Okay, I think she's referring here. If you mean used jewelry, in general, there's no zakat on jewelry other than uh, that of gold. And uh, some say on silver as well. But when it comes to the issue of paying zakat for the gold that you use, that's usually the question because most sisters are wearing uh, gold, mashallah, that if you have gold and it's for your personal use, you're using it, and it's not for business, you don't plan on selling it or anything like that, it's just your personal use, the scholars have differed. Is there zakat upon it or not? The majority of scholars uh, from the Maliki, Shafi, and Hanbali madhabs, all of them say there's no zakat uh, on this. And they have their evidence, which is strong in that. But there's another opinion where they have some hadith where the scholars differ is it authentic or not? And these hadith prove that even if you have the jewelry which you're using just for, zakat, for your personal use, excuse me and you don't uh, intend on selling it, that still you have to pay the zakat. So in the second opinion, which is even the opinion followed by many of our scholars from the days we live in, like Sheikh Mbaz and Sheikh Mbaz, they mean, may Allah have mercy upon them, that you must pay zakat for this gold that you are using, uh, even for your personal use. But this is if it is with you, obviously, for the entire year, and it's over 85 grams, that which is equivalent to 85 grams of gold. If it's more than that, then you pay 2.5% uh, of zakat for that gold that you have. And this is opinion is better you do it just in case, as we said, because there is a difference of opinion. And both views are very strong. They both have a very strong view. So it's better that you pay it just in case so you don't fall into anything which is haram and displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's more than 85%, you pay 2.5%, uh, sorry, 85 grams, you pay 85, uh, uh, 2.5, sorry, it's 85 grams. You pay 2.5 percent for the zakat, inshallah ta'ala, and Allah knows best. Uh, yes, uh, Sheikh, a lot of people do like to pay their annual zakat, which is different from the zakat al fitr in the month of Ra uh, Ramadan. Uh, so, is there also a base value on cash that you carry throughout the year that's in your savings account? Like, there's 80, you don't have to pay uh, on what is less than 85 grams of gold. So, is there a cash value that you can carry in savings? Um, that would be a minimum that you do not have to pay on, and then what do you have to pay on? So, if you were to look, for example, uh, at this situation, paying a zakat in Ramadan is good if, 
and I want everybody to pay attention to this. It's a big if. If your zakat is due in Ramadan, a common mistake that people make is they want the reward for their zakat, so they delay their zakat until Ramadan. And this is not permissible, this is haram. So the person, because the zakat, once the, the, the one year, the hul is finished, you must pay the zakat right away. So sometimes you'll find people have to pay their zakat two, three months before Ramadan, but because they want the reward of paying it in Ramadan, they delay the zakat three months or two months. And he's actually sitting this entire time where he reaches Ramadan. And this is something that's haram and not permissible. When your zakat is due, you must pay it. But if you started your savings during Ramadan, you start to pay your, your zakat during Ramadan, and you have to pay it, alhamdulillah, you pay it during the month of Ramadan, no problem. Or there's another thing that the scholars mentioned. If you want to pay your zakat in advance, let's say your, your zakat is due two or three months after Ramadan, and you say, you know what, I want the reward, so I'm going to pay it in advance in Ramadan. This is no problem, inshallah, as well. But how do you pay it? What is the value? Obviously, that which you have saved throughout one year, the whole, meaning the year has come from, let's say, today we're the 17th of Ramadan, and let's say if you were to start on, on today, your savings from today, and you come to the 17th of Ramadan next year, you have to see if that savings is equivalent to 85 grams of gold. And how do you know that? The 85 grams, you look at the price, and you, if you go online and you write it down in your country, you'll find right away how much the price is. I did it here in Qatar the other day recently. It was like, um, I believe it was like 137 rials, like 30, 39 or 36 dollars or something like that uh, for one gram. So if, if you were to look, for example, now in, in Qatar, it would be, uh, we did this yesterday actually, I think with the brothers, so it's still here. You can see it or not. There. It's 11,815 basically. So you see about 12,000. Uh, reals, which is close to about four thousand dollars, give or take. Okay, so if you have that uh, four thousand American dollars, so if you have that throughout the year, and it hasn't decreased, pay attention to that hasn't decreased, then you have to pay zakat of two point five percent on that money uh, when 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 the time comes for, for Ramadan, uh, if, if you start in Ramadan or the, when, the, when the year finishes. So if you have four thousand or more, then you pay zakat on that money or two point five percent. Uh, for each of the, uh, for, 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 the, for the for that amount, if it's less than that, I say focus on the issue of decreasing. It would happen sometimes. You had about four thousand dollars, but then you spent five hundred, then you saved another another five hundred, then you spent eight hundred, then you spent a thousand, and then you got another two thousand. So it's going back and forth. If it goes down any time throughout the year, you know that, then you don't have to pay the zakat. It has to stay at that level throughout the year. And if it stayed there, then you have to pay the zakat. Otherwise, there's no zakat and the law is missed. Jazakallah Khair for clarifying that for us. Um, and we also have a question from Rafi Muhammad. While being an intikaf in the masjid, can we go all the way to our home for bathroom purposes like bathing, urinating, and etc., and for some time to visit with our family members? What is the simplest and easiest ibadah which we can perform that will give us the most reward and blessings and forgiveness from Allah in the last 10 days? Uh, the first part of the question, uh, using the bathroom to urinate, I mean, obviously that's not permissible to go home for that, because you can do that right there in, in uh, the facilities they have there at the masjid. Uh, when it comes to showering and what have you, if it, and it, there's there's three types of showers that or, or the shower that, that the scholars mention uh, uh, that you could possibly be taking. One of them is the ghusl that's wajib. It's compulsory, and that is if you were to, for example, you were to have a, a dream as you were making a tikaf, and uh, you have to go home to make it the major ghusl, then it's permissible to go home. In fact, it's wajib upon you. It becomes a must that you go home and take the ghusl if there's no facility in the masjid. The second one is that you want to take it just like to, to cool down, to relax. This, the scholar says, it's not permissible to leave for this. The third type would be... Uh, to clean yourself, so you, you're not, you don't smell, you don't have a, a foul odor as you're making a tikaf. If there's a place in the masjid, then you have to use the place in the masjid. If there's a, a difficulty using it, or you have, you know, hundreds of people and you have to wait in long lines and you're wasting your time, and your house is not too far away, then okay, it's okay to go home and take a quick ghusl and come back. But you shouldn't be there socializing too much. I mean, if you come in, you say hello to your family, you say hello to your kids, how you've been doing, check on them a little bit for a few minutes, that's okay. <clears throat> but the better thing for the family is if they come in to visit you, 
And that's what happened with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Safiya, she came and visited him, and he spent some time with her, and then uh, walked her back to her house. So that's permissible. But you don't want to stay too much time in your house if you go back uh, by socializing with them. Like I said, just checking on them, saying salam, how are you doing? That's okay. But focus on why you're going on the ghusl. If you have an, the, an easy opportunity in the masjid, then it's not permissible to go. But if it's difficult in the masjid or there's no facility, then you can go back home quickly and return to the adhikab. And Allah knows best. Jazakallahu khairan. And also, uh, Sheikh, you mentioned that you were doing some calculations. I'm just curious. In the U.S., I did notice in the masjid they've said that the zakat al-fitr is $10 per person. What about fidya for the U.S.? Uh, if you mean for the person who can't fast? Yes. Uh, that, that goes back once again. Now, so if, if they're saying $10, that means it's for the, the sa'a. So it, it would be about $5 then. But then again, it's you should half, ask. It's, half of, it's yeah. going to be half of whatever your country says is the zakatul fitr. Exactly. It's also it's, it's better you ask just in case the ones who are paying because the, the ones who are there on the ground because they know the, each country differs. But in, and in general, I, I found that in, in reality that the prices they give most of the time uh, are not the prices. Uh, they're a bit higher. And I think they do that just uh, just in case. Because if you were to look, for example, if you were to go yourself when you go shopping. If you want to buy, for example, some flour or some rice for, for like uh, two and a half kilos worth of it, would it be equal to ten dollars or less? I'm actually not sure. I have to go check. So I mean, but in some probably countries, less. Probably less. And I mean, you can always get the sales or the bargains or the bulk, and it changes what you pay, so, obviously. So they, they probably might, if they increase, they might increase a little bit, but just to be on the safe side. But obviously, we need to reflect on something else, and that is. When giving something like zakat al fitr or to giving sadaqah, that we should always focus on, on giving that which is best. So if you add a little bit more, it's not a problem. That's why even some scholars mention for the zakat al fitr close to three kilos. And that's usually what I focus on myself is giving like three kilos for each one, uh, members of the family. So if you have you know five members, you give like 15 kilos. So to give a little bit more, it's no problem. And that's actually inshallah something good because. It's, you know, Allah, as he said, in the hadith of Qudsi, Allah tayyib la yaqul illa tayyib. Allah is good, he only accepts that which is good. So we want to increase, we don't want to, you know, take shortcuts and say, you know, if, okay, if they're saying $10, I might be able to get for seven fifty somewhere else. Alhamdulillah, it's, it's only two and a half uh, more dollars and it's, it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So give alhamdulillah and Allah will give to you inshallah ta'ala. So we should round it up so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also rounds up our provision as well. Alhamdulillah, because there's no decrease in the wealth from giving Charity, Zakat, and Sadiqah, alhamdulillah. Yes. Okay. okay, well, it's been an amazing, amazing webinar, and we are so grateful for you to come be with us today and help us learn everything that we need to, to learn to maximize the last 10 days of Ramadan. We thank everybody for attending and being so patient with us throughout our program, and also I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Sister Hira and Sister um, Banuka from our webinar team, and also to you, uh, Sheikh Abdra Abdrahim. Uh, we really do appreciate you coming today and spending so much time with us. Jazakallahu khairan and may Allah subhanahu wa make this the best Ramadan ever for you and for your family and your loved ones and for all of those who are with us today. May Allah subhanahu wa accept our fasting and our ibadah and all of our du'a and grant us a seat in genital fidosa ala at the conclusion of this uh, beautiful month. My apology. I took 18 extra minutes from the, the time we had. We had two hours. I took two hours, 18 minutes. So forgive no, that's, me for, uh, that's okay. We were we were happy to get that 18 extra minutes worth of extra knowledge. Jazakallahu khairan. May Allah bless you. You rounded up, Sheikh. So we're may Allah bless you for that. Jazakallahu khairan.